Welcome everybody to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the 17th meeting of 2014. Can I ask everyone to set off any electronic devices to flight mode or switch off, please? I'd like to start with introductions this morning. We are supported at the table by the Clerk and Research team, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room by security. And I'd also like to welcome the observers to the public gallery. I'm Margaret McCulloch, the committee's convener, and the members will now introdu introduce themselves in turn, starting here on my right. I can also ask when we get to the witnesses if you could give a short introduction of who you are and where you're from as well, please. Thank you. I'm Marco Biaggi. I'm the uh, MSP for Edinburgh Central, deputy convener of the committee. Martin Barr, good morning. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Uh, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Good morning, Christian Arad, MSP for North East Scotland. Alec Johnston, member for North East Scotland. Uh, Mike O'Donnell um, from Skills Development Scotland. Um, two distinct parts uh, to my remit. Uh, I lead the Opportunities for All um, remit within Skills Development Scotland, so that's the the, the guarantee of a positive destination for 16 to 19 year olds. And the second bit is through the national training programmes, uh, I head up the partnership work that we do with um, stakeholders across Scotland, local authorities, third sector and other partners as well. Um, Scott Reid from the Scottish Transitions Forum. Uh, it's uh, supported by ARC Scotland and we are a membership organisation that represents the voices of 500 different organisations and individuals across Scotland with an interest in transitions across education, health, social care and allied health professionals. Uh, my name is Kate Hanna. I'm Sector Lead Officer for Additional Support Needs and Special Schools uh, within HM Inspectorate Education Scotland. And my role is to manage the inspection programmes for the special school sector, and that includes grant-aided schools and secure care uh, services and units. Good morning. My name is Claire Fraser, and I'm the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Manager at West College Scotland. Uh, good morning, my name's Jim Gray, uh, I work for Glasgow City Council and I'm in charge of support to community planning in Glasgow. Thank you very much. Today's first agenda item is on witnesses' expenses. In keeping with usual practice, members are invited to delegate to me as convener responsibility for arranging for SPCB to pay under Rule 12.4.3 any expenses of witnesses in our scrutiny of the draft budget 2015 to 2016. Are we all agreed? Agreed, thank you. Agenda two is an evidence session on our scrutiny of the draft budget 2015-16. Today we have two panels of witnesses given evidence and welcome to our first panel. And thank you very much for introducing yourselves as well. Can I ask when you wish to speak during the discussion, could you indicate to either myself or the clerk on my left? And thanks again for your introductions. We're now going to start asking you some questions um, about the draft budget. And we'll start with Marco, please. Uh, I think we're all going to ask about different subsets of, of, of the issue, but I would like to ask about young people with additional needs in particular, uh, in terms of how well are they supported at the moment in making transitions, what are the, the barriers and how are we uh, trying to overcome them? Who would like to ask, speak first? Do, uh, Scott? I'd like just to set the scene. Um, as you may be aware, convener and members, that uh, the additional support needs figures have doubled since 2010. Um, so uh, that's an increase in 50%. Uh, additional support needs figures for pupils within schools now represent one-fifth of the pupil population. Um, additional support needs figures haven't increased because there are more people with additional support needs, I may add. It's just that we're better at identifying them. Um, from our experience in the Scottish Transitions Forum, if you look at the report that was given to Parliament last year, uh, there is a range of young people not being fully supported into what is called positive destinations. By that, I mean employment, education and training. Um, if you look at the figures, you're looking at uh, those without additional support needs having an 8% failure to achieve a positive destination. 
Uh, across the range of additional support needs, if you look across the figures, uh, those at the top of the, the, the failure rate, if you like, within uh, failure to achieve positive destinations are looked after children, those who have had interrupted learning, um, those with social, emotional and behavioural difficulties and those with learning disabilities, which is almost four times the amount for those who don't have an additional support need. So if you look at the figures, it's roughly 40%. Um, against those without an additional support need, which is 8%. Um, it's our suggestion from the Scottish Transitions Forum that if you focus purely on an educational pre to post 16 destination, um, in terms of positive destination figures, that will not meet the needs of those with additional support needs in terms of health transitions that occur at the same time and social care transitions that occur at the same time and ed education transitions that occur at the same time. So for those people with more complex needs, there needs to be a joint approach um, uh, through all those different kind of universal services, if you like, to make sure that we're ensuring to get transitions right. So looking at the figures, you can see it's a very mixed picture, and I would invite comment from the other witnesses. On that. Dr. Hannah. Um, yes, can I just ask you to repeat the question, please? Well, uh, <laughs> it was quite well covered there in, in terms of what are the obstacles for transition, uh, transitions in whichever, whichever field uh, you might want to, to, to name for uh, young people with additional support needs. Uh, how can we overcome them? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for this year's Ministerial Report to Parliament 2014, Education Scotland identified several key indicators um, which make a positive transition more likely for young people. Um, for example, where we have a whole school or service approach to transitions at all stages, where policy and practice are uh, coherent in, in, in schools and in services, where there are positive relationships with parents and carers, and parents and carers are involved at an early stage, where there's effective partnership working, um, and where the, the quality of communication is uh, well-established, clear and transparent, um, and that uh, families are aware of the, the uh, communication systems and uh, they know what the transition process will entail. And also effective planning and organisation, and, and we're, we're really talking about uh, rigorous and systematic planning and organisation at an early stage. Those are just some of the areas that we've highlighted which are prerequisites to successful transitions for young people with additional support needs in schools. Can I then ask, and I'd be open to any of the panel answering this, what should we be looking for from central government in the central government budget as signs of action being taken on this, uh, of, of support for this particular area of work? Um, in answering that question, it's a very it's a successful project that we've had. It's a third sector support and they've, I mean, I can talk tell you about ground level. Students who, who, are, who are in transition and they're moving on, they can be a wee bit anxious about their travel plans, about managing their emotions in a different environment, about even finding the right classroom. And it's about having the kind of the additional support there to assist them. And we can do it while they're learning, but actually getting them there in the first place. We've worked with a, 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 a a project called Moving On Transition Service, and they offer the kind of the softer support I think that you know that students need, and I found that very um, successful partnership. How is that funded? That's funded through it's a range of people. It's the Lotto and it's Share Scotland and Cornerstone. Okay. Can I can I ask when you're talking about um, sort of transition for maybe young people into from primary school to secondary school? Even uh, I saw a documentary about uh, young people with um, Asperger's and that's a difficult period for them to move from primary school where the routine is very sort of regular and they know what's happening. When they then go to secondary school, they're moving from class to class and it gets really upsetting for them. What support is there, there for people with that sort of background and support help needs? Dr Hannah. 
Um, first of all, I'd, I would want to remind everyone that there are specific provisions within the Additional Support for Learning Act relating to um, transitions, and authorities have a, a duty uh, to plan and prepare for transitions for young people from primary to secondary stages and from secondary school to uh, post-placement. Um, so it, that, that's that's all considered extensively as part of the ASL legislation. But um, to answer your question, um, HMI evidence from inspections in 2013 and 2014 show that enhanced transition programmes across primary and secondary schools, including for young people with autism uh, spectrum disorders, which target vulnerable uh, children from primary six at risk of not fulfilling their uh, potential and, and at risk of disengaging from school or not making a, a successful transfer, are showing evidence of better outcomes for uh, children and young people. Um, they basically involve targeting from primary six of youngsters identified at risk um, as, as part of community planning partnerships and also planning with secondary schools, um, targeting those young people and their families and providing additional support such as uh, summer programmes, uh, f frequent visits to the, the secondary school, close monitoring of um, their, uh, their, 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 their progress once they've made the transition to, to secondary school, nurturing approaches um, and transition passports which help teachers to understand better what their needs are and provide support strategies to enable them to, to, to meet those needs. Where, where we find these enhanced transition programmes in place, and we do have examples which we provided in this year's report, uh, children and their families are telling us that children make positive relationships, they feel more included, uh, they're more likely to attend and engage with uh, school in, in, in secondary school, and they basically are more likely to make a, a successful transition. Uh, Scott. Um, in, in relation to the budget question, um, we are experiencing cuts within education budgets and the key staff that work with young people with additional support for learning are classroom assistants on the whole. Um, it's our members' worry that if the resources are kind of reduced within the education environment, that people with additional support needs will be less supported within the, in, within the classroom. And that is basically the classroom assistant's kind of job to do that. Um, so it, in terms of budgetary considerations, it, we really need to look hard at the job that a classroom assistants do and how well they support people with additional support needs within the classroom. For, for fear of losing them, we will lose a kind of what's been touted, I think, in the Times Education Supplement as a generation of children with additional support needs. I would just like to add that in. Thank you. And Mike? Yeah, can I just add from Skills Development Scotland perspective, um, uh, we are, we're, we're, we're anxious to ensure that uh, young people with additional support needs are given the same a uh, um, type of support that they need to to make successful transitions uh, 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 into other forms of education or, or work and um, uh, we see this as partnership territory if you like um, uh, be it in a school where if someone's identified with uh, additional support needs uh, how we work with um, with uh, with uh, others who are uh, within school settings uh, to support those young people and in post school um, looking at a range of, uh, of other partnership agreements we have with uh, with um, could be third sector organisations for example who have got expertise if I could give you an illustration Recently, uh, we have done a lot of work with Enable Scotland um, to begin to tailor some of our products, for example, the Certificate of Work Readiness, um, to look at how that can be delivered with uh, um, young people with learning disabilities um, to enable them to progress in the same way as um, uh, people who, um, who would traditionally progress within that programme. So Enable uh, worked with us to, um, it was, this was part of a risk assessment we did on the certificate, and uh, um, they worked with us to ensure that the, the delivery 
and the, t the, the, the method of delivery and, uh, and also the documentation and so on uh, was, uh, um, was written in such a way that it, it facilitated the, the, the engagement of people with um, a, a learning disabilities. That holds good for um, across the range of products that we've got. We do risk assessments on them all and it's not a risk assessment, it's not a bland thing. It sets out some actions that we require to take and that again looks at who can we partner with in terms of specific expertise to allow us to tailor the products um, for, uh, for, for individuals. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh, beginning to look at the figures that are being put in the budget this year, uh, I notice that there's an additional £16.6 .6 million pounds allocated to the training, youth and women's employment portfolio. How do you see that contributing towards the achievement of your broader aims? Anybody like to start answering that question? Yeah. I mean, starting on that, um, absolutely. And um, and as I understand it, Skills Development Scotland have been allocated some of the, of, of the of the resource. And um, what we are what we are keen to ensure is that if I could use modern apprenticeships as the example, that that we've, been, we've also been asked through the commission, uh, uh, in the, the uh, Young Workforce Commission, to look at extending the number of um, modern apprenticeships that we deliver across Scotland. So what we are keen to do is to look at both sides, the supply and demand side there, and to uh, and to use this as a, an opportunity to look at and really do some um, a, um, re research that will uh, that will begin to tell us what some of the the, the, the traditional and non-traditional barriers are for young people, so that we can attract other young people, uh, oh, yeah, mainly young people, into modern apprenticeships that may not hitherto have had the opportunity to do that, but also to look at from the demand side, from the employer side, about how we can um, uh, up the ante with employers in terms of um, uh, communications and, uh, and knowledge and so on, and maybe to try to break down some of the barriers that they perceive may exist uh, uh, in terms of um, taking on some of the young people who have got um, a additional barriers or, you know, to, um, to progress into a modern apprenticeship. We're doing that in conjunction with uh, looking at um, uh, access, uh, um, enhanced access programmes, um, for, again, for young people who may not have um, moved into um, modern apprenticeships traditionally and uh, what is it we can do by way of uh, developing a, a defined pathway into apprenticeship opportunities and of course as, as members will, will be aware that there's a lot happening within the apprenticeship um, space just now in terms of not only the extension to 30,000 a year but also in terms of the, um, the type of apprenticeship and, uh, and also the trying to, uh, in terms of, you, you mentioned women there, trying to look at positive role models in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, breaking down some of those barriers where uh, traditionally women have not gone into, for example, engineering, and, uh, but, the, but that's, that's beginning to change. How do we use uh, role models to, uh, and, and also the, uh, the ambassador programme we've got for apprenticeships to, um, to help uh, young, young women in particular, maybe uh, within school and post-school settings, to think about uh, moving into a wider range of uh, opportunities. Um, that's great that that money has been put in. Um, for my concern would be how will this benefit people with additional support needs to be supported into the work environment? Has there been an impact assessment and how that would be um, dealt with within that? If I could ask that question. Would there be an, is there an impact assessment in terms of how people with disabilities would access that transfer? I'm afraid money? that's a question for the Minister. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, there are projects um, such as Project Search, I don't know if the, the members are aware of this, which is a project which helps support people with autism um, primarily into the workplace. Um, which is a kind of uh, intern project. They intern within different organisations throughout a year. And the last intern placement, I believe, is guaranteed a job. Um, and people with autism have a lot of soft skills that we've, we've mentioned. Um, 
that they need to learn to manage to navigate the workplace successfully. And that's something that could benefit from that funding. And I would just like to raise that. If you're not aware of the information around that, I can send that to you post the meeting, if that would be helpful. Could that question that you asked, do you want to just ask it again? Because we'll have it on record and we'll ask the Cabinet Secretary that question for you. Um, OK. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering if there's been an impact assessment done on the monies that you talked about, the 16.6 .6 million for people with accessing it with disabilities. OK, we'll get, we'll get that question asked for you. And um, Jim, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, yeah, it really is following on from that, because I think it's fair to say that in Glasgow we've recognised that... Um, there certainly is an issue we, uh, in terms of uh, under-representation of certain disadvantaged groups. Um, um, certainly, whilst we've made significant progress in addressing uh, youth unemployment in the city, um, we are conscious that there are, if you like, segments uh, of young people, uh, youth population of young people who are not doing as well as others, and that could be for some of the reasons that have been mentioned, but also geographic spread. Uh, certain parts of the city uh, it appears to be harder to um, get employment than in others and there seems to be a uh, particularly those furthest away from the city centre the travel seems to be an issue for example so we're, we're looking at this in the round but in general terms we would welcome the 16.6 uh, .6 million and we would uh, welcome the uh, uh, approach to modern apprenticeships but we would endorse what's been said that um, we think that these uh, interventions have to be tailored um, we have to be, perhaps become more granular in our approach. I'd also say that, uh, endorsing some of the comments made earlier, that um, without being trite about it uh, in any way, uh, it's really important that we do develop effective partnerships, more effect, you know, joint working, um, a more integrated approach, uh, uh, and improve uh, the, the, the ability of agencies and organisations in the third sector or private sector, whatever, to make referrals. So we need to have a more people-centred approach, which is actually tailored to the needs of the individual. And we would hope that uh, some of this funding can uh, assist in progressing that. Claire and then Kate. Yeah, just, I just wanted to note there's one um, particular change which has been proposed, which, which I welcome, and that is the... Um, proposal to work with the third sector to offer supported employment opportunities to groups who face barriers to employment. The issue that we have at our college and in all colleges is finding work placements for students with additional needs and what do they do after college. And there's also the, the, kind of the aspects as well that it's not just about getting a job, there's life skills, there's independence, there's stuff like that as well. But, you know, they want to be able to contribute and they want to be involved in doing something post-college. So I'm interested to see that point in the budget change. And Kate? Um, just a very brief point. You mentioned women. Um, what we're finding is earlier targeting of pregnant teenagers and young parents has been very successful uh, in keeping mothers in, in, in education and enhancing parenting skills and um, long-term work prospects. Uh, and, and, and there's evidence that that's leading to better outcomes for, for children. We have one um, project in, in Glasgow, the, the, the Young Parent Support Base in Smithy Croft Secondary School, which is an authority-wide initiative for, for, for keeping uh, pregnant uh, teenagers in, in education and leading to, to better employment prospects for them. Right. Just add one thing, and it's a, it's a point about the third sector. Uh, um, endorse the comments of supportive comments that have been made about the third sector. One of the things that bedevils the third sector, of course, is short term funding. And a lot of the services that we're talking about here are, are not discretionary services, I would argue, that they're, they're absolutely key uh, to, to any community across Scotland. Um, and um, uh, I welcome the focus um, that, uh, that we've also got um, Skills Development Scotland. We've been asked to, to lead the development of a third sector um, a employability fund for um, a challenge fund, a, a, it's European funding, and, a, and a, I'm currently working with third sector colleagues to, to, to colleagues from within the third sector a, to, to shape that fund up. And, a, and a, 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 the way that it's shaping up will, will certainly be strong focused on, a, strongly focused on young people who, who are traditionally 
um, uh, uh, finding it difficult to, to, to find their way into mainstream services and, uh, and how we do more around integration and also uh, bespoke services for, uh, for people who have got additional support needs as well. I think uh, Scott sort of preempted my next question, but it is as priorities change and uh, some budgets are allocated uh, greater levels of funding, other budgets are squeezed. And how will the reduction in some other budgets uh, affect your current activities in the next year? Um, I, I believe I said at the start, if we look at transitions in the round, if you like, if we look at it as a whole, process that happens between not just education for some young people but education health and social care those balances as the, um, those balances sorry those budgets as they become less will impact on these young people more um, and it's the concern again that people with additional support needs will be squeezed out and not be able to reach a positive destination so in terms of budgetary con constraints and changes, transitions isn't just a concern of education, but also a health care budget and also a social care budget. And if we look at the Joint Public Bodies Act and the Children and Young Peoples Act, they come with duties for uh, such things as continuing care for looked after children. Um, and I believe there is a limited amount of budget put forward to that already. What you would like to see addressed in an impact assessment? Yes, and, and just to see how, how, do, how does it impact, not just from an education point of view, but how does it impact if we look at it in the round across? And if there are deficits in other budget areas being built up in other budget areas, how does that all work out across when we look at a kind of joint service between education, uh, employment, healthcare, social care and the third sector? And what does that look like? Um, John Finney would like to come in. Uh, a point to yourself, Scott, about what you've said in uh, health and social care. <coughs> it's at different stages across Scotland, but there is the integration of health and social care. Are you seeing any early evidence of improvement about outcomes as a result of that? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I think because it's quite early days, it's a very, very mixed picture across the whole of Scotland. Um, I can only talk to the idea of transitions and how some... Uh, joint working between health and social care and um, the third sector have brought really good improvements in, in some areas, but there are others where the, the Joint Public Bodies Act has brought with it um, not just administrative changes, but actually work practice changes within that. Um, for instance, Highland and the island have done something quite, uh, quite um, interesting um, in terms of their approach but we're yet to see how that approach might play out in terms of transitions and that uh, budget constraints between children's and young people services and adult services being controlled by local authority or healthcare we're still it's still at early days so we're not sure how that would work but if we link it into the self-directed support agenda um, sorry legislation and the principles behind that the joint public bodies act should help with that idea of personalization of support and people's focus on outcomes and it's interesting that education in terms of transition sits alongside that at the same time and how do we then raise the question around personalizing education outcomes for people or employment options um, under that kind of agenda. So I see it all very much tying together, but I would say it's very early days to kind of make a, a comment on that. Thank you. Mike, can I ask you a question? You said you'd received some additional funding um, for Skills Development Scotland, but the actual budget shows that um, your budget has been cut by 1.8%, which equates to sort of 0.4 million pounds. What impact is this actually going to have on Skills Development Scotland regarding the sort of the training side of it? And built into that, you also mentioned that there'll be thirty thousand new modern apprentices um, in the forthcoming year. Is that within the same budget as twenty five thousand last year, or is there extra funding built into that as well? Sorry to clarify. Um, it's uh, uh, by twenty twenty. It will be thirty thousand. Um, currently it's 25,000 so there's a, a 5,000 increase uh, over that period so it's not, not, not an additional 30,000 um, yeah, obviously any budget cut um, uh, uh, makes us ha having to, to, to look at the, at the, at the service uh, that, that, that we offer and, um, and uh, like 
other public sector organisations. What, what, what we need to do is, com is to continuously refine what, what, what we're doing, get smarter at how we deliver services, and um, uh, but ensure that we protect um, frontline service delivery um, uh, across uh, the school community and other communities um, across Scotland. So, um, uh, of course, any budget cut is, 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 not, is not welcome, but, uh, but, 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 we, but we know where um, uh, uh, the world we live in in terms of uh, ensuring that, that we, we, we're able to provide the range of services that we are asked to provide um, in our letter of guidance um, from Scottish Government. Um, the additional funding that, that, that I mentioned was um, a, the, the funding that a, f from the a, from the, the Scotland's young workforce, which a, I gather is probably one-off funding in terms of allowing us to do some additional research and, uh, and communications and so on to progress uh, what that we're doing around uh, particularly um, modern apprenticeships. The other funding that I mentioned is not owned by Skills Development Scotland. It was European funding, and we've been asked to facilitate the, the, the delivery of that uh, with, um, with third sector organisations across Scotland. What, what about the, and excuse the, the, the terminology, it's, it's changed now, the NEAT group, is it all, what's, what's the group called now? It's not, yes. not well, an education well, employment well, or training. Yeah, a, this is the group that's not ready for to go into modern apprentices and which really need an awful lot of help and support. So what extra help and support will you be able to give them as well? Okay. There's two two parts to my response. Uh, the first the first part is that um, some of the additional resource that we've been given, uh, we'll be doing um, some, it's a deep dive, if you like, in terms of uh, some some research uh, uh, um, within SDS and our partners uh, to look at, um, uh, we, it's called neat access to, to, to modern apprenticeship, so it really sits within the zone of, uh, of, of what, you're, what, what you're asking, Chair. And, uh, and what we want to do is to look at what are the what are the transitions, or what's the additional support that we need to put in to create a pathway for young people um, uh, who might be doing things like employability fund programmes and so on, on and into um, modern apprenticeships. But also the work crucially that we're doing, for example, through foundation apprenticeships in schools and how we encourage young people to think about a pr the apprenticeship offer along with other um, um, career options that they'll have um, moving forward. So if they want to move into FE, uh, further education, higher education, but considering apprenticeships as, a, as an opportunity there as well. The second part of, uh, of my response is, is what we've learned through Opportunities for All, if you like, in terms of the work that we do with, um, uh, with young people who are what you would maybe term who are um, who are um, struggling to to progress, and uh, and the need to provide strong, uh, effective um, support to those young people. Um, uh, very often, um, those young people are not looking at that point for a skills intervention. There'll be other barriers that we want to um, uh, to, to to overcome before they're ready to to progress. And again, uh, what we've been doing through Opportunities for All is we've forged a, a lot of partnerships, if you like, with uh, local authorities, again, third sector, and other agencies uh, who can provide support for those, for those young people. Skills Development Scotland, but we're also with our uh, colleagues in local authorities, uh, the Opportunities for All coordinators. We've developed what, what are called Youth Employment Activity Plans, and what they are basically, uh, um, uh, what services are available locally um, and to support young people in terms of making a smart referral. So it's like it's a no wrong door approach. A young person might come through your door, but uh, but using the, the activity plan, you're able to identify the appropriate intervention that's required for that young person, and uh, and uh, and also monitor the progress that's been made. And from our perspective, when that young person will be ready for a skills intervention and ready to progress, so it's a partnership activity, and uh, and it's something that's owned, if you like. By uh, by all of the the services within any given local area, 
So um, those uh, just to, just to give you a quick update, if you like, on uh, on on the activity plans this year, we've been migrating a lot of the information from um, non-traditional employability services, if you like, um, locally. So um, so information on a. Uh, uh, services that are available for young people with additional support needs or other uh, other interventions for uh, equal opportunity groups, if you like, uh, to make sure that they are all seen as part of the employability landscape and that they can benefit from the wider range of offers that are available in any local um, uh, community planning area. How well is the partnerships working with the local authorities and other organisations? We have, um, uh, we've, uh, we've got 32 um, uh, local employability partnerships and, um, and what they're charged with, and they're called different things, Chair, but uh, what they're charged with doing is, uh, within the context of community planning, is to, is to address a, um, the, a coherent approach to employability locally. And um, and I would have to say, um, as you would expect, it's probably a mixed picture. Some some areas uh, um, uh, have progressed faster or quicker than other areas. But uh, the direction of travel across Scotland from where we've started seven or eight years ago is certainly very, very encouraging. Uh, that's not to say that, that you couldn't sit there and say yes, but you know, and give instances. Of course, you could, but uh, but I think that there's now a better understanding and a broader understanding of the range of activities that underpin employability moving forward. From our own perspective, within Skills Development Scotland, we are partners there, but also um, um, there are particular programmes that we deliver where we where, where we form subsets, if you like, of the main partnerships. So, for example, provider forums to give providers the opportunity to come together to look at the range of activities that have been delivered by the provider network in the local area, which can be quite wide ranging and engage with um, DWP as well as other localised services. Thank you. Jim? Uh, can I just add to that, Chair, that uh, a couple of points. One, that in Glasgow, we through our single outcome agreement and the priority attached to youth employment, uh, are very much uh, emphasising that um, there is growing evidence that uh, the problem no longer um, is uh, unique to the 16 to 19 year olds and that we are looking at uh, the issue up until the age of 25. Um, and therefore we've been encouraging our partners to look again at um, how we're working, how effectively we're working to address the the needs uh, of uh, uh, the, the older age group within that category. I um, could also say that we're, we've undertaken quite an extensive review, a, a mapping exercise uh, around youth employment provision in the city. In fact, we have a major event about this this afternoon uh, back in Glasgow, and that we are hoping to uh, co-produce an action plan with our partners as a successor to the Youth Employment Partnership in Glasgow. So, in a sense, we are looking to uh, uh, re-engineer our structures and processes to adapt to the emerging trends. I um, could also say that in Glasgow we recognise that there's, there's also a, a supply, uh, sorry, there's also a demand problem in that um, whilst we uh, have seen improvements in youth employment in the city, uh, statistically there are now less jobs available uh, than before the recession for young people um, and there's a real challenge uh, to address that. So we are starting to look at uh, in what we, we can actually also begin to address the, the demand side of this. Thank you. Um, can I just, uh, yes, Scott? Um, it's our concern, well, our concern as the members across Scotland, that as we cut resources for things like Opportunities for All and Skills Development Scotland, um, the, the spectre of eligibility criteria for services will raise its head, and as, as you may be aware, that as you cut budgets within local authorities, eligibility criteria for services becomes more and more tight for, for young people. And it's our concern that with these projects, with the, the resources being less, that the eligibility criteria for children who have more complex additional support needs, they might be pushed out of the support that they actually require to get into jobs. And if these people aren't working with them, and helping support them into employment, who will be doing that? And, and we're at risk of losing them, uh, as I said, the lost generation of additional support needs. So I'd just like to add that. Can, can I finally ask, before we move on to Christian, you've obviously experienced some working with the young people with additional support needs. Um, 
what actually needs done to help the young people that have actually got these needs encourage employers to actually employ them and what encouragement and support does employers need to make the whole thing work? That, I think, is the, the million-dollar question. Yeah. If I could answer that, I think I'd be a rich man. Um, from my experience of working directly with young people with additional support needs, if you focus on what I would call a kind of hotel model of support when you provide things for young people, such as housing, such as job application support, if that young person isn't ready to move into that situation, that positive destination, even though on metrics it looks really positive, within two months will break down because you've not actually focused on the well-being of that young person. Um, so that's part A of the question. Um, part B of the question might be that there is so much discrimination and stigma towards disability across not just Scotland but the UK um, that to really, really manage the issue of supporting people into employment effectively that's something that probably would need to be tackled um, and it's a bit out with my remit to answer how that might be but that's what I would see the way forward. That's excellent, thanks very much. Um, Christian. Thank you very much Governor. Um, I will keep on asking the million dollar question because uh, it's uh, it's quite important especially for the modern <laughs> apprenticeship scheme. scheme you know, we we know the figures, and we know that the very rural representation from women, from people from ethnic minorities, and uh, people with disabilities. So, you know, the million dollar question is exactly this: is where do you think the budget should concentrate on? Which is the priority? The priority, you know, like uh, uh, we talked about, uh, uh, trying to help uh, companies to employ uh, all these people. Always is the priority on the soft uh, transitional. Uh, a part and helping uh, the third sector. You know, what, what, what is, where do you think the budget should concentrate on? Where, where, where it has not yet and where it should? One of the areas that we think that there's not enough emphasis uh, placed is on actually in young people who are already in employment, in sustaining employment, in terms of in-work support and in-job progression. Um, because we think that a significant number of young people are, are failing uh, due to the lack of uh, in-work support and also, at best, are getting trapped in uh, entry-level, uh, low skills, low wage, zero-hours contracts, jobs, um, and are, in a sense, also uh, uh, blocking the pipeline for other young people. So the ones that should be progressing aren't able to progress. So we think these blockages, um, uh, I think there's, there's mixed views on uh, 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 wage subsidies. There's a lot of emphasis in, uh, in the, uh, some of the funding packages on wage subsidies and some employers are, are basically reacting to that and saying, well, you know, wage subsidies on their own aren't enough for us. That's not necessarily what we're looking for. Um, we think we need to work with the private sector in particular to try and encourage them to make uh, and with DWP, and we've had some discussions with them about this, uh, about trying to encourage employers to uh, recognise that there is an economic benefit to them in um, helping their particularly young employees, but employees generally, uh, access training through the colleges, etc., and giving them the flexibility. Um, we'd like to see more flexibility in the funding generally around this. You know, look at uh, how can they be, how can we be more creative and you know. Uh, I don't know if this is a Scotland-wide phenomenon, but certainly it's the reaction we are getting that while wage subsidies are valuable uh, and important, that they're not the only uh, mechanism that uh, we think we need in order to uh, effectively engage with employers to encourage them to recruit more young Glaswegians, retain young Glaswegians and allow young Glaswegians to progress up through the, the, the employment ladder. Anyone else like to comment? Mike. Just a, a quick comment. I think it's also the recognition that very often it costs a bit more. Um, the, the, the journey for, for, the, for, for those individuals can take longer and, um, and therefore the resource um, uh, needs to uh, match what the needs of the, of the young person or the person would be. I think um, Scott mentioned, for example, a project, Project Search, which I, I know well, um, does a, a really good job in terms of supporting young people or people into into employment, a lot delivered through NHS for that. 
and um, and I and I think I I get a sense that the public sector could do more in that space in terms of um, supporting uh, uh, people back into employment. Um, there's a lot being done, but I but I just I just think that uh, we 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 could always do more. But I think in in this particular uh, space that that, uh, that that the scope to do more in terms of uh, the public sector as an employer in terms of um, providing support um, to uh, to people who need uh, um, support. Sometimes it's difficult, and, and, and employers perceive it as quite difficult if you're a small business and uh, and providing that support um uh, which can uh, something uh, and it can be an unknown very often for um, for a business can be quite off putting so i think there's a whole issue there about um, putting more resource into how do we break down some of those barriers how do we do a lot around case studies of uh, where things are working and people you know it's much more apparent where things are working and uh, um, spending some you know just putting some resource into uh, into that as well should, should it be done by sector as well? I know that Energy Skills Scotland up in Aberdeen has targeted uh, uh, ex-service personnel, for example, a woman to take them in engineering. Is that working? Uh, should we put more money on, in, into this, in, into uh, government agencies? Or we should maybe uh, prioritise, maybe the budget should prioritise more in the, in the third sector? I, I, oh, sorry, yes, yeah, sorry. I, 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 I wouldn't say it's an either-or. Um, I think that um, you know, as, uh, as 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 any other citizen citizen in Scotland would expect, you know that they can they can access an opportunity where where, where it best suits them. So so if, if 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 people have got additional barriers, then 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 then, then surely we should be aspiring to, to to for them to have the same range of opportunities that that, that other people get. So I think I think doing both. I think that. Work within third sector, support through third sector, work and support through public sector, and uh, and indeed private sector uh, is something that should be should be um, on the table. Can, can I just uh, uh, add to that? Um, in in terms of your question, I, I agree with with Mike. It's not an either or. And to use the language of outcomes, and and young people have their own outcomes and their own wants and their own desires, and to kind of say this would be the answer to everybody's problem, I think would, wouldn't be the right answer to give. Um, so a real focus for me, I think there was a question, to, to be honest, in, around the metrics of positive destinations and how that gels with uh, the, the principles behind well-being and young people's well-being. And do, do the two match? Are we looking to get people into an employment without kind of looking at what their well-being might need to be? Or are we looking at their well-being and is employment part of that? So that's kind of the question that I would raise in answer to your million dollar question, I'm afraid, is, is you know, I don't think there's one size fits all and, and we need to personalise the support for, for individuals that, to their needs, I guess. Thanks, um, moving on to John Masoner. There are, um, I mean, opportunities for all has been mentioned already, and I, have, I confess I'm not an expert on it, but I, I do understand that one of the suggestions is that in every school there should be a, a post-16 transition team and a, potentially, I think, a school post-16 transition lead. I mean, I'm interested to know, is that actually happening in schools? Do we know if that's happening across the country? Um, thank you. A <clears throat> um, we're, we're certainly aware of uh, the potential of the, the senior phase now um, through Curriculum for Excellence in Scottish secondary schools. Um, and we are we would certainly be encouraging all young people to stay in learning post-16 is the best way of ensuring their long-term employability and, and contribution to society. Um, in terms of transition planning, we have a number of uh, tasks just now within Education Scotland in which we, we are looking um, with our community learning and development inspectors um, at how they work with secondary schools in order to support young people to have a high quality um, work experience placements and college placements. At the moment that's at an early stage and it's due to report in 2015 um, but w w we would hope to have clearer information about how well schools are um, delivering on that agenda 
but uh, w with regard to transitions teams, it would, that would tend to lie with pastoral care teams and support for learning teams at the moment and their, their partnerships with local employers. But I'm not aware of specific examples and it sounds like a very interesting idea. I mean, you jobs and... I mean, I get the impression that we, we talk about positive destinations and, and we tend to look at that as one figure, but presumably within that, um, you know, a youngster could go into a quality job or they could go into a pretty grim job, as has been suggested already. Do you think there's enough uh, breaking down of that or do, do we take put, put too much emphasis on this phrase, positive destinations? No, I don't think we put enough emphasis on it. Um, to be honest, we're, we're still at an early stage in collecting data about um, positive destinations. I'm sure Skills Development Scotland will be able to say a wee bit more about that. Um, but... W w there are certain key elements that we feel would be important here, that, that the right learning, for example, must be in place. Um, building the curriculum for is about uh, skills for learning, life and work. Um, we're still working our way through the senior phase just now, but we would hope in the future um, that that would certainly provide young people with appropriate uh, information and skills, for example, financial support, um, managing budgets, advice and guidance about what's available and, and how um, employment and employment opportunities could be matched to their needs. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Yeah, this, uh, in response to, to, to Mr Mason, I think that uh, from our perspective, what we are developing is an approach which suggests that you know there isn't one single transition uh, and it isn't a, a linear process either, that young people can go back and forward. And in a sense, we need to, as a community planning partnership, um, construct a model or work with our colleagues to construct models of interventions which are appropriate at different stages in that cycle uh, for, for uh, young people. Um, and um, it is, I think, important uh, that we improve the data sharing and intelligence uh, that the agencies can share. And I think there are big issues there we still need to tackle around uh, data sharing, um, particularly for the, uh, the older group, age group. Uh, it, it, it's become a bit easier for the under-19s, but we still struggle. Uh, and part of this is to do with uh, uh, Data Protection Act, quite rightly, uh, regulations. But we need to, I think, have a... Uh, an approach that emphasises, as you say quite rightly, the, the quality of jobs as well as um, and the quality of life for the young person. Um, because there's a lot of evidence that, um, you know, people uh, in transition don't always... We, we need to help them succeed in making that transition. Uh, and uh, sometimes that will require more than one intervention. Yeah. Can I follow up on that yeah. before Mr Reid's coming in? Um, I mean, you, you mentioned age, and you've mentioned that a few times, yeah. and I'm interested in that because you said that actually Glasgow's, you're going beyond the 19. Yeah. I mean, is there too much emphasis from here, Parliament or the government, on it's got to be 16 to 19 uh, and not enough flexibility for what you, I think you're saying is that we need a more indivi quite an individual approach sometimes? I think we were saying, yes, we think there needs to be more flexibility, that um, um, there is no doubt that there still is an issue with uh, uh, school leavers, etc., but there's also an issue with college leavers and there's an issue with graduates from universities. Um, and also that um, sometimes the positive destination is to a college place and we don't always know what happens to them after they leave college. Um, and that uh, the under, the, you know, there is a significant underemployment problem in, in, in the Glasgow economy now amongst young people, many of whom are on part-time or zero hours contracts. And that you know, um, what one could spec, different people have different views about how positive that is as a destination for some of these young people. It also causes great problems for them. I mean, I was, I'm aware that, for example. Uh, uh, the, uh, those on uh, zero hours contracts with fluctuating hours, it can cause them horrendous problems with housing benefit, for example. I was recently at an event um, where a care support worker was describing a case he's working on just now, whereby um, uh, the, this young uh, uh, chap has, uh, against all odds, to be frank, managed to, to, to get a job. Unfortunately, it's a, a zero hours fluctuating hours contract. It's made it extremely difficult for his housing benefit to be calculated. Um, the support worker was engaging with the housing provider um, to resolve a rent arrears problem, uh, keeping the young person uh, 
if you like, uh, accessing the relevant service. Um, you know, uh, when I was that age, I wouldn't particularly wanted to have to spend a large amount of my spare time trying to work out my housing benefit. You know, and who I have to tell what to. We don't make life easy for people, basically, um, and we need to change that. So let's get, get into a wider area, possibly. It, was yeah. it Mr. Reid, you wanted to say something? Yeah, um, it, it was, uh, uh, back to your comment around transitions coordinators teams um, under the uh, the additional support for learning act there's a duty within the education to call a transitions meeting one year before that pupil is due to leave school um, and call what they call appropriate agencies around the table and appropriate agencies could in 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 fact involve the opportunities for all coordinator or skills development scotland um, so that, that I think currently people are looking at how this measures with the, the named person or lead professional role within the Children and Young People's Act. And that would be the person responsible for calling, causing this, or calling um, this transitions meeting around the table. And there are some local authorities that already have dedicated transitions teams. But in terms of people with additional support needs and the marry of the Children and Young People services to adult services, there is a real difference between the pull and push from, for instance, paediatrics to adult health care, um, from children and young people's uh, social care to adult health, uh, social care, and from uh, school to college. So it can be a very, very mixed picture, but the duty does reside within, within education. Um, is it down, or would you say, I mean, is it just because schools are getting used to it or whatever? It's been, I think, on the statute books since 2004. Um, so we're, we're still seeing a mixed picture. Um, and it's because, again, we're looking at teachers who are overstretched or not aware of the legislation or um, paying tokenistic measure to what a transition meeting looks like. But there are things within legislation that do provide for a very long planning process, potentially for young people. And it should provide that platform for young people to step into uh, higher education or further education, sorry, or um, uh, university or the jobs market or looking at what is their positive destination. And I have problems with that because it is employment, educational training. But for some people, our positive destination is supported housing with volunteering. And we're not measuring those kind of metrics with that phrase, positive destination. Um, and also to, to, to mirror Jim's point around longitudinal looking at transitions. If you look at the looked after children's figures, it's quite it's quite scary the lot, how many of them don't make a positive destination. Um, in any way tied in with this rigid kind of age thing that I some was, of them might take a bit longer to get to the same place? Um, I was going to say that um, for people who are looked after, it can be, um, and excuse me if this seems inappropriate, a bit of a knee-jerk reaction to actually push away the services that supported you because you view them in a particular way and it takes them a certain amount of time to kind of get back on their feet. So it would be interesting to see how many children who are looked after might actually be going to university at 25, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, is it just that that time that, that they need there? Um, so at age 18, it looks awful, but if you look longitudinally, it might show an improvement. OK, thanks. Could you answer very briefly, because I've still got John Finney's got a number of questions and we really should be finishing shortly this session. It was, it was it was just a, a point of information for for Mr. Mason. The uh, opportunities for all uh, is uh, for 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 young people with additional support needs is up to your twenty fifth birthday. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Moving on to John Finney now. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll wrap a number of questions into, into one. Then perhaps um, uh, panel um, figures can only tell us so much, and there are challenges associated, as we know, with uh, poverty deprivation. What are the particular challenges that you each face as a result of the, the, the higher levels of uh, unemployment associated with poverty deprivation? Um, and do you feel there's any reflection in the budget of the additional challenges that there may be? Scott, do you want to answer first? Very short. Um, as you'll know, that a lot of people with additional support needs have parents who have um, disabilities or additional support needs and as you'll know that those parents and families are already in poverty. Um, we have a lot of case studies from families that will come forward who are able to speak about their experience in transitions in this particular area 
my concern is it's those that don't feel able to speak that are not represented in any in any way or form because they don't know what their rights are they don't know what they can ask for they don't know what support is available um even with the great work that that goes on there are people who are my future is I will be living on benefits with my parents um, or even where hopes are actually built up for young people with learning disabilities or additional support needs at transitions time for instance um, a family came to me recently and said um, you know how's your transition going what's what's happening and, and, the, and how's your service provision and they said what service provision because the eligibility criteria was set so high that they didn't meet that so that young person with an additional support need was sitting at home not doing anything um, after they had been fully supported through the school system that cost quite a considerable amount of money for them to fail and not go any further seems a travesty to me um, but that that would be my two cents and Anyone else like to comment? Oh, just just to Mike. say that that, that, um, that of course any additional resources welcome resource and uh, and what I see across um, a, a employability in Scotland and skills in Scotland is that we, to squeeze as much out of what we've got um, in terms of uh, um, service delivery and uh, frontline service delivery. And, uh, and I suppose I've been doing this long enough to see that whenever whenever we are subject to uh, to um, cuts or whatever, that um, one of the things that does benefit from that, if you like, is that we, we form smarter partnerships, and uh, and uh, and it does uh, it does give you an alliance with others who, um, to look at services that are being provided um, by others and how you do that in a more collegiate way as well. So I think a lot of the partnership activity that uh, that we see in Scotland um, brings together and 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 does max is beginning to to maximise the, res the the resource that's available through through the third public and uh, indeed private sector as well. So so there's there's a bit of a benefit there as well, but um, it'd be nice to have the resource. Uh, Kate, uh, thank you. Um, special schools are, are telling us that they're very concerned about difficulties in accessing appropriate work experience placements and, in particular, fewer uh, college courses for young people with complex additional support needs. I know we've spoken quite a bit about that. Um, although we, we've come across some good virtual college models um, in, in some of the independent schools, um, complex needs transitions funding and any additional funding that might be available for helping those uh, either colleges to, to support them to provide courses for those young people or um, ways in which they can be supported to access college courses would be very welcome John yeah but I, I'm sure it would. I don't know that's within the gift of the committee, of course. And, and, and one of the issues that, that Mike touched on there was partnership working. Um, and it's all very well that there are partnerships. How effective are these, particularly with regard to um, some of the uh, objectives of Action for Jobs, Scotland's youth employment strategy? And particularly with regard to how effective they've been with, and with a lot of cliches this morning, and I'll add another one, the hard-to-reach group who are marginalised as a result of deprivation, poverty, whatever. Okay, well, that's a programme that's delivered through the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Is that is that the one you're thinking about? I, I don't know the detail of um, of delivery. Um, um, I know from colleagues within SCVO that um, that they feel that it it does um, that it has got an impact in terms of of um, getting to young people that that, um, that that are harder to reach. I know that within my own sphere, that for example, uh, we we deliver um, employer recruitment initiatives for targeted you know targeted um, specific um, young people. We do that in partnership again with uh, a range of uh, of third sector organisations, um, and uh, and that's and that's a programme that 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 that, that brings together um, disability um, offenders, ex offenders, and uh, and uh, you know a whole um, and others from a uh, black and ethnic minority communities as well and that's and that's a program that encourages employers to um, to support um, uh, young people for, for, you know that are harder to reach and is a uh, and is a is growing that program actually in terms of a, a employer ask for that um, and the they're quite difficult groups um, sometimes to identify and uh, and sometimes to find within uh, local areas as well. So so targeted programmes can work um, if they're given time to embed uh, 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 locally and to get known by by um, by young people 
uh, provide, you know, um, service providers and also, uh, crucially, uh, employers. Because unless we engage employers, then we're not going to move this forward. Thank you. Very briefly, please. You mentioned about asking how the partnership was working out. And to be absolutely honest with you, there is a wee bit of past the buck going on. So you'll get a local authority isn't quite sure. Um, there's no definitive responsibility between, say, local authority and the kind of the social support and the health and care and the, the further education sector as well. And there's different practices going on in different colleges. So sometimes it doesn't work so well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Start, it's an ongoing challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask them really briefly, this really, really quickly, uh, the Scottish Transition Forum really sets out to bring together all of the people that I've mentioned in terms of transitions and we're starting to get really really good attendance across the board within different professions such as education health and social work looking at local models of supportive transitions forums within local authorities to allow bespoke solutions within that authority to work so um, I can send you information about that ongoing if that would be interesting um, I'd like to now finish this session. Thank you all very much for coming along and um, sharing your knowledge and information with us. We really appreciate it. So I'll now suspend the meeting briefly to allow the second panel to take their seats and thank you very much.
Uh, welcome everyone to our second panel of witnesses. Um, can I ask you when you wish to speak, if you could either indicate to myself or to the clerk on my left hand side. I'm actually Margaret McCulloch, the committee's convener, and the members will now introduce themselves in turn, starting here on my right, followed by witnesses. And if you could actually say your name and give an overview of where you're from and your background, the organisation you're from. Okay, thank you. I'm Marco Biaggi. I'm the member of the Scottish Parliament for Edinburgh Central and Deputy Convener of the Committee. Uh, good morning. Van Va, good morning. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Hey, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Hey, good morning. Christian Arad, MSP for the North East of Scotland. Lorna Trainer, uh, Director of LNG Learning, Scotland also representing STF and uh, STAG. Good morning, Fraser McCowan, uh, Managing Director of Argyle Training and also a member of the Sport Training Action Group and STAG. Good morning, my name is uh, Sa Sandy Stark. The organisation organization I'm from is um, Shmoo FM Station House Media Unit and um, VSA Voluntary Services Aberdeen. Brian Webb, work for Station House Media Unit and look after all the employability work that we do. Before we start asking the questions, could I ask Lorna or Fraser to actually explain what STAG is, please? Stag, uh, support Training Action Group. Uh, we represent providers who work with additional support needs, uh, young people and adults. Very much. Um, can I now pass you over to Mark, who's going to ask the first question? Thank you. I think we're all going to ask about a, a range of, of different subgroups, but my opening question is really about the particular difficulties that face uh, young people with additional support needs in making transitions uh, in their lives. Uh, what would you say those obstacles chiefly are and how well do you think we are supporting people through them at the moment? Who would like By to answer way? first? Sandy? Yes, please. On you go. Um, well, the, the, your transition from school is definitely one great... Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great big thing because I I treated school as like a, like my second home. I started school s since I was five, so I I really tr treated that as my second home, really, and it was, and it, it was if, like the fun times of starting school and things like that. And I really learnt a lot from school, and and then once I left school, the school um, progressed me. Th on to college and the college opened um, so many doors for myself and it showed they, they tried to uh, show myself um, what learning opportunities that I could um, could offer and things like that so I, th I think it's a great big uh, achievement for somebody that's got learning difficulties and support, support needs and I, and I think um, we, we do need that sort of help and support because it's it's a, it's, it's a great big wide world that, that you're actually going into once you leave school. Mm. Lorna, I think a lot of younger youngsters play, um, experience huge barriers, whether it's learning disabilities, physical disabilities, mental health problems, often unrecognised. Um, Poverty often leads to difficulties as well. Youngsters are excluded from um, class and uh, activities. We have a number of youngsters who, for example, left school and still don't know how to work a computer. And that's really quite unexplainable in today's society. But that's the kind of youngsters that we support on a day-to-day -day basis. I recognise, in terms of the additional support, um, um, legislation 2004 and the amended one 2009 that we also include support for youngsters who are um, looked after and accommodated for example in my own program we do we deliver the employability fund and 33 percent of the youngsters are looked after and accommodated i think that's rather higher than average so i recognize and i think fraser as well a number of youngsters who um, go through the national training programs are probably higher than average in terms of disabilities, exclusions, uh, disadvantage in society. So we, we also recognise in terms of the additional supports legislation that youngsters when in school have uh, an individual learning plan and that follows them through. But often that's just 
dropped and left once they leave school. And I'm slightly worried about the transition from school to post-16 learning and development. Again, we support a lot of youngsters with no information, no support plan, and we are kind of left to, to work around that and somehow or other try to, to support those additional needs without the infrastructure that they may have had at school. And that, I think, we fall down. Because I think one of the other questions is, do we work with other agencies and how does that happen? And I think we're failing in that sense of, in terms of multi-organisational working. So I have concerns about that. We're often left to pick up the pieces, if you like, and national training programmes often support a higher than average number of youngsters who are disadvantaged for the reasons that I've mentioned there. Yeah. And it's not always, the information is not always available or passed on. A lot of these young people perhaps haven't engaged in education, so when they, they present themselves to, to the providers, then these things become apparent, and it's quite difficult at times to get the support for them so that they can continue to engage in the national programmes uh, and move on into employment or further a higher education. So we, we find that a challenge quite often. And then, of course, from our own point of view, the kind of rural aspect and trying to, to fit in, there can be huge distances between where a young person is and p potentially support. Um, and there's not always uh, funding available to kind of match that in or flexibility within some of the programmes to allow for that. Can I ask how they present themselves to your organisations? What route do they go through to appear at your door, so to speak? Often through careers advisors. Um, so they've been through the school, they've maybe just left school, or DWP for the older um, people who come on the, to the programme. Or some will refer themselves because their friends have been on the course, they liked it, and they've come along themselves. So, But it's predominantly through career guidance. OK, thank you. Uh, Brian, do you want to just comment? just like to echo some of the stuff you were saying. We're the same up in Aberdeen. I think there's a disconnect between where young people are in school and where they are when services pick them up and there's always that missing information so you are playing catch up as soon as you take a young person and you're trying to find out where their learning difficulties are, do they have dyslexia what's their learning style what's the best way for them to learn that thing about IT, do they have an email address can they access the, the internet and nine times out of ten the answer is probably no And so as projects you are playing catch up and you're having to try and figure out the best way to uh, address the young person's needs, whereas if they came with an actual learning plan that actually addressed all these issues, you would be maybe not 100% ready to work with them, but you would have a, a good starting block to actually start working with them. I'm taking from this that a positive destination isn't necessarily a success, because if the positive destination is going into employment and they fall out of employment a little bit later, then that, that's going to be an issue. But just working with what we have at the moment, the positive destinations measure, there's a, about a 10% gap, generally speaking, between people with young people with additional support needs and, and the, the population at large in getting positive destinations. Could that be closed to zero? Could that be closed so that people, young people with additional support needs were as likely to go into positive destination? And if so, what would that take? Right. Could go to zero. I think um, if the third sector and other projects were invested in more, so rather than, you know, there's, there's disrespect to Skills Development Scotland or the Job Centre Plus, but we're the ones that are doing the groundwork, the ones that are taking the young person and moving the young person on. If we were given more resources and more money to actually do the work that we could do, I reckon we could take that to zero quite easily. Can you ask what resources you would need? I think it's a bit... Uh, about um, that's about having the information on the young person. We've got gatekeepers. We've got the job centre plus who's a gatekeeper. We've got skills development Scotland who are a gatekeeper. We have the information on the young person. Use the third sector that are out there to give them the actual information that they need on the young person, and then they can put a real action plan together for a young person. And I think if we work with young people who have got the right information, we could take any young person and get them into a positive destination. Can, can I just build on that? Am I right then saying and understanding that through the whole school process there's a, an action plan identifying what each individual person's particular needs are and then as soon as they leave school that stops and that information is not then passed on? Yeah. Can I ask a really simple question? Why does that not happen? I have no idea. No idea. No. Has anybody asked? The, yes. the schools for the information? Yeah, on a regular, and, regular basis. And what, what's the response? Some are slightly confused. Sorry. sorry. No, go, go for it. Some are slightly confused in terms of data protection. Mm -hmm. And that information shouldn't be going to you. There's trust issues around working with other agencies. Not entirely sure what it is that the other agencies do. 
Um, sorry. I can certainly be we do have a thing called GERFET, getting it right for every child, and it seems to work at school, but it doesn't seem to work once they leave yes. school. So, no. so by, by you not having that information, what does that put you at a disadvantage? What, 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 cause, what problems does that cause for you then, and what do you actually have to do to overcome that? Uh, Brian? Uh, or, and then Sandy? Yeah. I think it's just about uh, building up the right profile for a young person. For it. To be successful, you need to know what style uh, a young person learns, and each young, and you know yourself, everybody's an individual. So to set an individual learning plan for a young person, sometimes it takes you two or three months to even get to know the young person and get to know where they are, where their learning barriers are, if you had a starting block with that information already in front of you, you could cut down that two or three months leading to try to get to know a young person to actually physically get on with the work. And I think that valuable time of getting that young person in and getting them moved on could be half, if not quartered, if we had the right information. Sandy? I think they're, they're your own personal support plan that you, you, you get from school should actually get... You know, you should be allowed to take that away from 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 school because that is your own personal uh, at your own personal plan and no, n nobody nobody else is going to gain anything from it because it's your own personal plan i think that should be it. You, you know we we called it in a record re record of achievement for when we left school that should be the first thing it's in the um your first page of your, of your book is your personal plan what 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 you've gained from school and, and it's something that you can take to an employer and say look this is what I've gained from school this is what I can offer you and then and then and then it's up to the employer to say right look I, I think you're more than capable of progressing and then the, the things that you progress more on you're, you're learning your um, support plan should, should never really stop because everybody's learning so, every single day. So so when you left school and you went to college, yes. your information didn't go with you? No. How uh, did that affect you? What problems did that cause you? Well, when I was at college, I had to kind of restart all over again. Things that I had already learned at school, I told, I told the college that I've already learned this like IT cooking and things like that they they were basically doing the basic stuff again what I had already learned from school I wasn't like learning anything new I I was kind of like told I had to do it because they didn't have a record of it but if your support plan went went along with you I I, I wouldn't be sitting there like kind, kind of wasting my time re redoing something that I've already done done at school did you feel having to do that again upset Real annoyed, yeah, and, and, and re real annoyed because I, because I know I've done that, mm -hmm. and bec because they didn't have that in paper, I had to, s you know, you, you know, and sit and do do that again. Thank you, Marco. Does the information pass on automatically between primary and secondary levels? Is it post secondary that's the problem, or is it any kind of transition? With post secondary, I'm not entirely sure if there is a problem between primary and secondary. Mm but there certainly is post-secondary. Can anybody comment on primary to secondary, whether that's an issue as well? No, Could not honestly tell you. And going back to the point I'd asked before about what it would look like if we could close the gap entirely, can I ask, how are you each, each of the organisations funded at the moment? What's the balance of sources between local, SDS, anything else? The only funding, for example, um, I mentioned that uh, the areas that, that our organisation work with is Employability Fund, and the statistics there, 30% looked after and accommodated, um, and of, of that number, 29% have additional learning needs. Um, we, we also support 6% uh, from ethnic minority backgrounds, and on top of that, 35% with additional needs such as uh, disabilities, learning disabilities, mental health problems, those kind of areas. So they're fairly high statistics uh, in terms of the average population. And of that, 
we managed to achieve, I'm not, this is not just about pushing our organisation, I'm not viewing it in that way, but we managed to achieve 53% positive outcomes. The only funding is the Employability Fund, £55 per person per week. That's, that is the funding you get to do that. So it's on a shoestring budget, but we do recognise, and back to your point there about what else do we need, I'm not kind of saying we need tons of money thrown at us, but we do need to recognise what exactly are the needs of the young people, and they're not recognised. I, I literally supported a young person yesterday who is homeless, who self-harms, who has severe dyslexia, also has eczema, and yes, the day before she had self-harmed, and I was fixing her arm and putting a bandage on it and trying to work with her with other agencies, for example, the self-harm organisation. I recognise we need a lot of support from mental health services. You had mentioned earlier on, not just the traditional NHS ones where you go and you get tablets, but the other types of services, the softer services, I'd like to, to call them. And I'd like to see more of that and us all working together and communicating with each other. This multi-agency approach I absolutely get, and I think we could do much more in that sense, and I'm, I think we're failing there. So it's not just the, the transition from the, uh, the, the learning plan from, post, from pre uh, secondary to post is just one example of where it just stops, and we're not doing what GERFEC wants us to do. We're not doing what the Curriculum for Excellence wants us to do, and we are left to pick up a lot of those pieces and try and do it the best we can. Fraser, would you like to comment? Yes. Um, again, like Lorna, it's really the employability fund that's there to support these young people. Um, and as Sandy says, we, we get people presenting to us, the information's not there. So you're asking them the same things. They've already given this information maybe two or three times. So they, they switch off, they, they disengage from the programme, um, or you can spend a lot of time trying to get the support. The way uh, the funding has changed uh, quite markedly from the previous programme for young people, which allowed you time. Uh, we used to engage with many other services that could support, but now it's, it's, it's quite a short programme now. So if they're not ready to hit the ground running, then it's more difficult. So we, we find that quite challenging. The average programme is what? Eight weeks on employability. Mm. And is employability fund as well? We have an employability fund, but as an organisation, we are say, several uh, funders. We have Inspire in Scotland. We have... Uh, Children in the Need, we're, uh, we've got money coming in from a uh, Fairer Aberdeen Fund. We have some money coming in from Aberdeen City Council as well. So we have a, a multitude of pots that we try and bring in so we can do the work that we do. Can I just actually say we've just actually had the parliamentary photographer coming in to take photographs this morning as well, if you're all okay with that. Yes, you okay with that? Yep. Can I ask as well each of the organisations... Do you work really closely with other voluntary organisations and do you find that with the young people, because they've got so special needs and need a lot of help, there's a lot of intensive one-to-one -one support from staff from your organisations doing that? Who would like to answer first? Fraser? Yes, that, that's correct. There's an awful lot of one-to-one. -one. I mean, we've, we've had additional training for staff to try and identify some of, of, some of these needs and, and we're looking going forward to, and doing more. Um, through Skills Development Scotland and other agencies. Uh, we are a social enterprise as well. We are, we are very active in, in the, the social enterprise arena, so we do rely on partner organisations for support uh, and, and, and sharing information on an informal basis. Um, so we, we try and get around some of the problems that way. Uh, we are quite closely with loads of organisations. You can't do this work on your own, so you need to build up really good working relationships and get to know what other projects can do. And, how we've sort of got, it's got to know people's names as well, so you can pick up the phone and actually physically phone someone and ask them for help, uh, advice. And like the one-to-one -one work, we use a lot of the activity agreement money to do one-to-one -one work to try and focus on young people and try and take them for a point to, so they're ready to access some of the courses that we can offer. So if they're not quite ready, we'll use the activity agreement money to try and bring them to a, a certain point so they can then access some of the full-time programmes that we can do. Activity fund programme is, please? The activity agreement money is money that Aberdeen Council's got. I think other councils have got it as well. Where it's a, for young people who have left school with no positive destination. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're not quite at a point where they can access an employability fund course at that stage before. So it's grabbing the young people when they leave school who have not, haven't got a positive destination, aren't ready for a, a full-time course and allowing you to work with them to get them to a point where they're ready to actually access a, a course to then get a positive destination. So 
if that's stage two, it's sort of stage one just before they're ready to do anything. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, were you finished? Yeah. Yes. Um, can I move on to Christian now, please? Yeah, good morning. Thanks very much, uh, Corvina. Um We talked about positive destination and uh, to what extent uh, can we evaluate how this positive destination is positive? Because we heard in the earlier panel that uh, there is not follow up uh, after uh, that positive destination. Quite happy to answer that. But yeah. well, certainly for SMU, we monitor our young people uh, for as long as they stay in contact with us. We've, we've got a, we've, we say, uh, uh, we've got our own Facebook page where we monitor young people. We get them all. We did try and set up our own Facebook page to get young people to stay in touch with us, and it failed because young people don't want to access another Facebook page. They want to use Facebook. So we've set up a closed group, and I've been with SMU now for five years, and I've got five years worth of young people on the Facebook and. Uh, every six months we need to report to Inspire in Scotland and I could tell you every six months exactly where the 500 odd young people we've worked with, exactly where they are uh, every day because they stay in contact with us all the time. So having that information is there, positive destinations, we, we can access it on a regular basis and be able to feed back to any funder on where they are. And if they follow it, a positive destination, it's worked for us as well because they always put it up on Facebook that they've lost their job or they've... Uh, they're following it with their boss, and then we can pick up the phone, get them in, meet them, give them some uh, offer, some advice and information, and try and save the positive destination if it's a way to uh, uh, crash and burn. So we're in quite a fortunate position. That, uh, I know a lot of projects aren't, but we've got uh, quite up to date stats on where people are and where they stay. We follow up in some cases, well, in many cases because of the funding stream, there's a kind of uh, sustainability payment, so the, there's an incentive there, but be, because of the areas we work in and the support we've given young people, we've built that bond with them, so informally they keep in touch, and if they've got an issue, they come to us because they trust the staff member that supported them, so informally we, we probably track them, but nothing formal beyond uh, kind of statutory requirements for the programmes. Well, no. We do pretty much like what you do, we have the Facebook and Twitter page and we keep track of everybody. We have that down in a database as well so that we do know what the longer term, short and longer term uh, outcomes are for the, the young people. Um, but I'm aware that at one of the meetings I was at recently um, in Glasgow, for example, there is, a, there is a definite lack in looking at follow-up and longer term sustainability, if you like. Um, for example, some people, the lever, school leaver destination figures said that they went on to college. And then what was coming back is that a lot of youngsters, significantly those that stayed on just because they didn't know where else to go, left college, and that's where it, they were lost. So there was a significant number in Glasgow between the ages of 18 and 24 that nobody knew where they were or what they were doing, but they weren't employed. Um, so I'm aware in general terms there is a lack of what happens longer term. We've got short term statistics. So we do our own kind of, we recognise there is a gap there and we try to fill that in for our own local services, but there isn't necessarily a cohesive um, longer term statistical analysis there. Sorry. That's where the kind of, you know, the, the college comes into, you, you know, this the schools support you to get into college and then the idea I got from college was they wanted you in, complete complete your course, and then out again, and and, that, and that's all they were wanting. They they um they just didn't because because I've got special needs myself and things like that. I just didn't feel I was getting I, I, you know enough support, you know, to say look look at that this is where we think you are what do you what do you think and um it was just lo and behold that i volunteered with uh, v vsa for for five years to prove to vsa that, that i could be a candidate for for them i could be an employer for you know i could be employed by them i showed them the skills that i had learnt from school so at least i had something to fall you know fall back on from college and I managed to get, you know, the help from uh, Shmu as well and uh, VSA. They they worked together. Uh, Shmu gave me some um, helpful tips, and I I I just worked t together. And I just think it's I I just think it's a shame for 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 young people. You, you know that they've worked so hard 
all through their school life and they get pushed on to college. But I just don't feel the the college are doing, you, you know, enough with somebody that's got um, additional support needs. Did you have to find out yourself about these organisations when you were at college, or did somebody tell you about them? Some, so, I found out about VSA myself because I was, um, I I went to the, their holiday fun clubs at like Easter in the summertime and things like that, and I got to find out that um, VSA was a a voluntary or organisation, and I got told um, when I was at one of their um, fun clubs, um, because because I was sixteen, I could not no longer attend their 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 club but they 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 took me aside and said look you you can stay with us but we'll take you on as a volunteer what what, what, what do you think of that and i just couldn't i i just, I just couldn't say no because i think um volunteering is a great opportunity for somebody um to build up their confidence with with an employer and if it's something that they want to do i think that's great in volunteering, um, I, I'm now I'm I'm now um, a trainee support worker in a nursery called Maisie Monroe Ch Children's Centre in uh, Aberdeen. Excellent! Congratulations, and you're enjoying it. Yes, I I I, fair, I I really do enjoy it. And my highlight of my day, if I if I'm getting the my my um uh, thing is I need to. Get get the children ready to go off to school. So if I know if if I'm, I I'm teaching the, ch the children the skills that I've learned from school. But break, but breaking down the skills that, that I've learnt, so they've got the understanding of, of learning f through play or, learning through um speaking or taking turns and things like that. But, but if you break it down. It, it's it, it's much easier for for them to to understand, and we've got a great um, you know we communicate with uh, parents pretty well, so we've we've got that um, you know we've got that background really well, we've got that covered really well. Thank you very much. That's excellent, Christian. Uh, to, to go back to the line, uh, you know, is there any on this transition uh, processes? Is there? Uh, Anywhere the budget is failing, maybe not uh, getting fund to where it needs to be done. I'm not talking about extra fund. You know, we all want more money uh, at at every level. There, there is no question. Uh, but where do you think there is a lack, especially on the on the transition period between school and between programs and afterwards? Because we just talked about it. Where do you think the budget is not targeting right just now? Where, where the funding should go? Transport because every um, person, uh, you know, le leaves school and that, and they go to college and things like that. And um, the, the the college turn down and say, right, you, you we ha we have not got um, funding in place for 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 transport. But the the people that have got um, learning, you, you know, learning needs and that need the, the taxi to get them back and forth. Because because that's all they can, you, you know, that's all they can uh, re rely on. Because it's too, it's too stressful for a young person, and it's got needs or that maybe to go on public transport. It's maybe, they, they maybe can't cope with big crowds of people. That it it just depends on their needs, and our our needs to be more funding in place for for transport and um, purposes from to get get them from A to B from house to college or work or anything or needs to be that standard to put in place for them. No. Um, I'm going to go back. There's a number of points there, but I'll go back to it. It's great that you're volunteering. Some of the other activities that we do in our organisation, um, our, our commercial work, is working with social service organisations and we do training and education there. And I've got quite a bit of experience of uh, supporting people with disabilities who have been denied access to voluntary work because they don't fit the picture of a volunteer. So you are very lucky you got it. But what that tells me is that, there, and, and there's a lot of other evidence, it's not just from you know, my experience, uh, in terms of attitudes around people with disabilities, uh, whether it's gender, 
streamlining people into gender specific jobs um, or uh, attitudes about young people because we still find that from employers. Um, I would like to see some kind of promotion work there about trying to shift attitudes. How do we do that? You often have to have positive examples of how that works. We certainly have lots of examples where employers taking on someone with a disability or a non-traditional you know, gender-specific role or um, someone who's got additional needs, for example, um, where that works and it's good to promote that. So perhaps there could be some funding to promote and support employers to do to take on youngsters, to maybe take some risks, some chances. So I'm kind of aware of that in terms of the, the promotion, if you like, and changing, shifting some attitudes. The um, other example, sorry, I'm just going to go back to the bit about the learning plan from the transition from secondary school. You ask the question, what's the value of knowing that? And another example, if we have a short programme of, say, eight weeks and you know that information, what we tend to do is, uh, if we find it out, is we then can tell the employer, for example, this young person here has autism, here is what it will mean, here is what you will need to do to support this person. And we often find employers then, once they know that, that's what shifts it from being a failed placement to one that works, where both learn how to work within a workplace and the employer learns how to support and understand and get to know someone with a disability. That's the beauty of it. And we're denied that, so we have to work really hard, scramble about and try to do something about that within that short period of time. So I'm sorry I'm covered up digressed a bit there. Um, but I certainly would like to see some terms of floating attitude, positive attitudes towards people with disabilities. Before you answer, on, on that, in the back of that, if you were to sort of look at trying to improve the transition process, what would be your main recommendation to actually bring forward? Um, I certainly would like to see schools working much more closely with the post-education um, agencies like ourselves, not just colleges, but ourselves, and also social work services. I'm very much aware that, again, within the spirit of GERFEC, it's not working where um, a young person may be um, involved in social work services, maybe someone who's been through the offending um, system or looked after and accommodated, they don't want to really engage with us, and yet this needs to happen. We need to be talking, we need to all be talking, including the young person, not just us as the experts. But that doesn't happen, so we've not quite got those nice little smooth links within the transition, and that worries me. Yeah, there's a real gap between stage one and stage two of the pipeline. You know, for a young person coming out of school, if they're not quite ready for stage two, it's what happens with them. The, the activity agreements will meet some of the needs, but again, it's a short period of time, so th these young people can be left languishing there as well. Um, even when they have perhaps have engaged in one of the, the strands of, of the employability fund and they come out and they've, they've, uh, they've been on the programme and they haven't uh, achieved a, de a positive destination, they're then not picked up again until they're 18. So there's a gap there as well, you know, um, which which needs to be addressed with with, with the youngsters. You mean they're not picked up until they're 18? Well, they, 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 they can't re-engage if they've, you know, they can perhaps have two bites at the cherry if, if they've, they've gone forward. And, for example, if, if they're doing the certificate of work readiness is one of the outcomes for, for the employability fund. Once they've achieved that, if there's nothing else for them to do, they've achieved it and they haven't moved on to, to further higher education or employment. <laughs> so they're then not picked up until they're 18 if they're not employed by DWP, so these young people can be left and, and they go back. We, we find that in some areas where they've been on a programme, um, they've, they've, they've hit all the targets for the, for the programme, they've achieved all the outcomes in, in their, their uh, learning plan, they've got the qualification, but they're unemployed, but because they're under 18, they've got no other way of engaging to, to, to any kind of financial support. Um, so it's, it's very difficult uh, as well. Uh, and, and what we're finding now with, with, with most of the kind of mainstream programmes, uh, they're all knocking on employers' doors as well, uh, looking for voluntary places. So there is even more pressure now for a young person even to, to try and engage you know, through, through a voluntary route because these places are being taken by, by adults in some cases. So it's, it's been difficult. So these young people that you've managed to get engaged again in the system learn all the core skills, learn the skills they need to make them employable, then they get to a point where the funding stops yes. and they're left in limbo for maybe it could be a year, six months, it two years, yeah. Yeah, yeah, till they're 18. And then the whole process has to actually start again because yes. they've lost, they've probably lost all those skills. Yeah, they've lost the, that. yeah the, the, they're getting stuck in a rut again and they're getting caught back in the system where daytime turns into nighttime, etc. Yeah. yeah. And there's absolutely nothing there for them at all. There's nothing certainly in our area, and, and, and 
what what we find we're, we're getting people now engaging further you know with adult programs that we had maybe four years previously uh, on, on the young because there was nothing for them in the gap. So what percentage of young people go through your programs does it actually happen to? We we've got fairly successful conversion rates, but, but you're probably talking you know more than forty percent don't go into a positive destination, and if they're under eighteen, they don't always get, get, and don't engage. Then what happens to them? Brian, we're sitting at eighty five percent success rate this now, so it's fifteen percent that are mm -hmm. probably moving on to a negative destination. That, that's actually quite worrying, isn't it? Because all that money's actually been invested in those young people to give them the opportunity to build their life up and then because they want to actually do something, there's nothing there for them to do. Yeah, they're not getting the opportunity to do it. Unlike yourself, but Fraser. As well, the point that Lorna was making with, with the schools, because we're not part of the education system, it's quite difficult mm -hmm. um, to engage with the schools. I, I, I do a voluntary programme in Industrial Awareness Day with our local grammar school which I've done for the last 26 years. And I find a lot of the young people who get the most from that are those that are not engaging academically. They go back into the school and then there's really, they're motivated in that sense, but there's nothing for them to pick up on. I think we need to kind of look at that as well, because you know, uh, I think we could do an awful lot more. I think okay. the other issue um, I find, um, you'd mentioned earlier on, uh, John, I think it was um, about some progress can still be a positive outcome for the person, but it may not be what is perceived a positive outcome in terms of a job, modern apprenticeship, FE, but it's still some form of positive outcome for that person, but it's not necessarily statistically um, uh, monitored. But another wee example I can give you, quite often our programmes are quite rigid and it is a framework around employability, but if, for example, you've got someone who has been looked after and accommodated, um, who has some really in-depth problems, don't have a, a history of anybody working in their family, so don't know how to, how to what, what internal disciplines you need in order to work. They don't have the behavioural um, attitude to work, don't understand it. And it's not because they're, you know, they're bad kids and they're going to be, you know, be criminals in the future. They just don't know how to do it. They've probably been failed in school. We do have a number of examples of youngsters in that situation. We can't do it in eight weeks, and maybe employability isn't the only thing. It's, it's thinking about that. They maybe need more time. They maybe need other types of resources and facilities to support them. We can engage the young person, and they want to do it, and they desperately want to do it, but maybe don't have the internal, whether it's resilience, emotional intelligence, attitude, internal discipline, to actually achieve it. So they feel as if they failed it, and that's not what we're about. We don't want that, but there is some kind of positive outcome in terms of they have been engaged, and you would want them to then go on and do something else. But what else do they do within a framework that says this is all we have, this is all we think about? We're not actually thinking about or understanding what those additional needs are and how to address them within the framework. Sorry. Um, am I right in saying then you work within a very tight time scale of eight weeks for each yes. individual person? Yes. You can extend it. Sorry, Brian. We take 12 weeks. We do a 12-week employability course. We've based ours around 12. And then what we do is we, we've just started. We've added an additional six weeks to young people. We've realised that not everybody gets a positive destination in 12 weeks. So we've added an extension of a six-week for any young person that, does go on, that doesn't have a destination at the end of the 12 weeks. So we offer, can really offer an 18-week programme for young people. And then what we try and do is, if they don't go into a positive destination, we keep them engaged with SMU through... We've got a radio station and a film department, so we get them involved in doing voluntary work with us, and at the same time still deliver uh, once-a-week employability clubs to try and keep the young person engaged. But stuff that we do on the, off our own back, not because we have to, but because we've invested that time and effort into the young person, so we want to keep them engaged with us and at the same time still try and move them into a positive destination. But we realise it might take quite a bit of time. This is not funded through the normal skills No, we have to fund that through other people. Other processes. To, to yep. What we have found uh, through our own organisations, STF and STAG, is that there's no consistency around the number of weeks. We may put in a submission for a contract that says, actually, we think we, we, we need 16 weeks, for example, but the contract comes out and the contract tells you what you're getting. And there doesn't seem to be any kind of um, discussion there that says, well, we've reduced it to eight weeks rather than the 16 that you asked for, that's what you're getting. And that worries me slightly, that's contractors themselves. When I started Get Ready for Work, and I've only been doing this for about the past three years, we had 26 weeks to work with the youngsters. That was wonderful. 
absolutely wonderful time to do all sorts of rich work with the youngsters. Then the following year it was reduced to 16 weeks and the next this year, 8 weeks. No rationale for the reduction in that. There is some flexibility but not an awful lot because you're so tightly tied into forecasting and forecasting is based on you have been given a contract for 8 weeks and if you need to go over that you need to justify and rationalise that. So somehow or other we have created some rigid systems and not allowed for this lovely work that you can do. So this eight-week programme is for young people who could have maybe dropped out of school, um, behavioural problems, literacy and numeracy problems, health, physical problems as well. And within eight weeks, you've got to get them up to speed to move on to a mainstream programme, like possibly modern apprenticeship. Modern apprenticeship, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I think a, a, a young person as well, though, is, it means s s sometimes you've got like an eight, an eight weeks um, to, to complete things, but that, but that young person might not fully engage in that eight weeks. That young person might need a wee bit more, a, a wee bit more time, maybe a bit more one-to-one -one, um, sort of basis to, to bring them up to speed. Because I, because I feel, I, I, a young person needs, you know, you know, their own time to, to think. Right, if I actually manage to achieve this, but they're they're they're, they're getting on, they're getting rushed too quickly, for for their eight weeks. So it, it just needs to, you just need to try and think. Right, is it is this young person engaging enough? Are they learning the skills, or, or do we need to work just a wee bit more, you know, on a one-to-one -one sort of basis, to make sure they can get get the same sort of skills? Because you're kind of, you know, kind of discriminating against maybe a, a a a young person that maybe needs, you know, that wee bit extra help and support, and maybe that young person's maybe not that, that confident in coming up and saying, look, I need. You know, just that wee bit extra support and that, but that that that's where your employer should come in and say, look, this is the this is what what your weaknesses are, and what your strengths are. We we need to try and f fix out to try and get your weaknesses up to up to scratch to to your own ability. Um, Christian, are you finished questioning? Yep. Yeah. We'll move on now to John Finney. Caught you by surprise, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, panel, I, I spoke at the, the, the previous um, session about um, what might be regarded as hard to, to reach and the challenges associated with areas of deprivation and the relationship between poverty, de deprivation, and some of the work. Um, but I'd like to go a little bit um, off tack on that and thank you, Mr. McEwen, for your submission. <coughs> There and clearly a challenge that uh, it would be good to have on the record from you verbally is the 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 fact that it's a one size fits all as regards the funding, and how that clearly doesn't work with a, a rural area. And of course, I'll declare an interest uh, an area I represent as well. Could you maybe expand on that, and particularly what the previous arrangements were and what has changed? Please. Uh, what, what has changed dramatically is, is, is the funding package and the length of time. Um, Providers in the past were also paid a weekly allowance to support young people, so it was all about the quality of the provision and the outcomes will come from that, but now it's chasing the outcome. Everything seems to be on the outcome, so there's, there's a, a start fee. So from that start fee, you've got to work out the viability and the length of time of your programme. Now, ours on average is 12 weeks. Now, we, we operate in, in Argyll and Butte, but we also operate in Inverclyde. In Inverclyde, we are fortunate that we get groups of young people referred to as possibly or probably half a dozen, four to six at a time in Argyll. It can be one, and it can be one in Cameltown, it can be one in Oban. Uh, I have colleagues going to Isla today for a, for a three-hour meeting. Uh, they've left at seven o'clock this morning. They've got an overnight um, with the possibility that they might engage. Now, we, we've been established in the area for 23 years and always supported the, the rural and remote Areas, but it's now becoming more difficult to do so um, with within this this kind of new funding regime. It was recognised when when Highlands and Islands had the the, the skills remit, and 
uh, there was an allowance made there, whether it was for modern apprenticeships, additional milestone payments to offset the, some of the additional costs of going to these areas, um, and also what was what was get ready for work. It was uh, £120 a week rather than £75 uh, to offset some of these costs. Now it's one, the one-size-fits-all, um, which, which is proving difficult. We are now having to uh, make very tough decisions, even although we are a charitable status organisation, we still have to cover our costs. So we, we are now you know, probably coming into to a situation where we will not be able to support some of these young people in these areas because it's no longer viable to do so. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. And, and can I ask, for the avoidance of doubt, Mr McEwen, are, are we talking exclusively Scottish Government money here? Or is, is there DWP money involved in well, as well, or is that a similar basis? Well, it's kind of difficult because um, quite often the rules don't allow different levels of funding to come in. If, if you're getting employability fund money, you, you're not able to subsidise that with, with, with other funds at the time. You're disqualified, and, and, and similar to DWP funds, if they've been funded for one particular strand or programme or initiative, they can't get support from another. Whereas if they were joined up at times, particularly in rural areas, we could do more and, and prolong the period of support. And, and that, that change comes when the removal of training from high hands and hands enterprise in, to... Into Skills Development Scotland, yes. yes. But, but there, there was a recognition initially where there was an enhanced rate, but when the Employability Fund was launched, it's now one size fits all. Uh, and, and it's very difficult because, uh, as I had said in, in, in the, the, the submission there, when the pilot was done for, for the uh, Certificate of Work Readiness, um, I know that colleges were involved because I was involved in some of the consultation afterwards and uh, one of the colleges publicly said at one of the meetings for the providers that they had a cohort of maybe 20 students who had already signed up for a course and they picked 12 to do this. Oh, how it would be great to be able to, to, to do that, you know. Uh, and as a charity, re regardless of the, the person's barriers or needs, we will take them on and, and do the best we can for them. So it can be very challenging. Uh, and you suggest in your written submission there that this is further compounded by a change with regard to the hospitality industry. Yes, can some, you expand on that, please? Yes. Uh, some of the funding frameworks, you know, they've been reviewed. All of them are reviewed at the moment. Uh, with the result, some of them have been reduced. Um, in, in our area, tourism is, is probably the biggest sector. So that, that makes it difficult again to, to go out and fund these places. So we're denying people the opportunity. We're denying employers quality staff, uh, quality training to, to, to get good quality staff uh, or to retain them. Now, would it be your understanding that decisions like that would have been the subject, whether by at Scottish Government level or more likely at, at agency level, to be the subject of a, an equality impact assessment? I'm not sure what the decision or how it, how it came about, um, whether that was a consideration or not. But clearly it has a disproportionate impact on remote and rural Absolutely, areas. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, with, with regard to Aberdeen, Mr, Mr. Webb there, uh, and issues regarding... And, and, of course, we know that deprivation isn't restricted to urban areas. In fact, rural deprivation can compound a lot of the problems. But are there particular area, uh, issues there regarding your work? We're, we're funded to work in the seven areas of deprivation within Aberdeen specifically. So uh, we're... All the work that we do is to target the, the region areas. I think Aberdeen has this perception that we, because we're the oil and gas capital, that we have, we have very little deprivation. In fact, I would compare sometimes to places like London, where the has and the has nots are, are extremes. The, the areas of deprivation in Aberdeen are, are quite quite bad. And so all the work that we do is to go in and allow uh, these areas to, what we call, reclaim their voice. So it's about working with them to allow them to get access to media, access to projects, access to the employability fund and be able to actually address their issues and actually move on from uh, where they are. But all the work we do is there, so we're, we're, it's, it's not about looking at what we can and can't do, we just specifically get money in and look at what, we'd, what we're going to do within a region area. Okay, and, and, and the panel, there's been mention made about sort of collaborative working um, and particularly with regard to action for jobs in Scotland's youth employment strategy, how effective is the engagement between different agencies, the statutory agencies, the third sector, whoever? In our area, because of, of the rural nature of it, it's necessity, so it, it happens by default. So we, we do, wherever possible, work together. Uh, a lot of it's informal because of data protection issues, you know, so we, we, we do support each other. Um, so it does happen out of necessity. You have to, for this work to work. You need to be able to work with third sector stature organisations and you need to collaborate to, to, to together, work together. If not, you're going to fail 
fail the system and fail the young people. And that's where the young per person's um, r report would come in from from going from going to school and you, you know what this this is where their report would come from. Instead of having the young person's report shut down once they leave school, they could actually take their report to to their employer and say, "Look, this is this is the skills that I've got," or or take your um report to like an organisation and say, "Look, um, that this is the skills that I could offer. Is it a you you know is is there an opportunity for me like to volunteer to?" To show you the skills that I, that I've learnt from school or from college or from other organisations, Mr. Stark. I mean, clearly you viewed that document as, as, as yours. It was yours rather than the education system. Uh -huh. Was it was it made clear to you that that document wasn't shared with the college, for instance? Well, well they, they. I know it became apparent, but. Uh -huh. yeah. Um. It was just. I I I just felt that the college I put in my report of of my needs to to the college and that and I don't I don't think the the college even bothered to look at my application properly to um support me with with the needs that I've got um so that this is why I had to go back and redo everything that I had le learnt from school but if they if you know if the, if the school had let me take my um support plan with me in, instead of shutting it down i could have went into the college and said look i i don't think you've looked at this properly this is what i've actually done and then i could have moved on to new challenges f for myself and you know and gained myself a new ch a, a new challenges i understand I think your point earlier, you have to make connections with other organisations. Yes, that's absolutely right. But what I find is that often organisations don't think outside of their own organisation. They just see what's happening within what I am doing rather than thinking what, who else can be involved, what is their role and what can we do to work together to improve the outcome for that person. So they kind of tend to see it as service delivery only, not the young person and the young person's journey or adult's journey. Um, an example for that might be schools not fully understanding what training providers do, not fully understanding what national training programmes are about. Um, uh, colleges being aware of it, they would be. But um, other services not necessarily knowing what else is out there. So there's a bit of a disconnect, I think, I feel. You scramble about trying to do the best you can, but I'm not sure if that's good enough. I think there should be more of a connection, an understanding of, and an acceptance that not just general terms of partnerships, people don't really always understand what partnership working actually means, but it's about the learner's journey, first and foremost. And we, as services and resources, should be working around and with for the learner, and that I'm not quite sure if that message is out there yet. You, you know, it's it's up to the the young person themselves to to you know to go to the employer and say, look, I found I found I found this piece of information. Would this be you know Would this be help, helpful for for, for the organisation that you work? Or volunteer with, you, you know, for them to engage more information and get more training in, involved or something, or or get more help and support in in place for a young person. I think I I I, I think that's what we are missing. We we need to work clo closely closely to together. I think with every or organization. I think. Uh, I think every organisation should be like printed out in a piece of paper or, or on some sort of website that every organisation should be, you know, access, you know, to get help and access to, you know, so so they can make that bond together and say, look, th this is what we can offer and this is another organisation can offer as well. So if they do get somebody th through the door with learning support needs, they, they 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 can go right. They this is what this young person's got. Um, we don't think we've got. You know the, the things in place just now, but this is when, 
other organisations you can pick up you can pick up the phone and say, Look, is there any chance we we can see this type of um equipment put in place for a young person, you know, for them to engage, um you, you know, to help them achieve what they the, what they've got to offer by just put, putting this um little bit of help and support in place. Thank you very much. Christian? Yeah, sorry. Uh, just on the point, thank you very much for coming there. Uh, regarding, it's quite interesting to see that uh, well, a multi organization working in partnership together and getting different strands of funding. But there are other organizations, I think Shmu, I know Shmu quite well, and uh, you alluded to it saying that you do have multiple services. To, to, this, to, to the young people and with different tribal funding. So what do you think will be uh, for, for the better approach for the future? Would we concentrate our funding into different organizations and push them to a partnership? Or do we maybe go to a multi-organization with multi-services with multi-funding? What will be the best approach? Especially in rural areas as well. Funding should be all about the individual and not to fit into a programme. It should be demand-led and needs-led. So if, if a, a young person or an older person had whatever needs, there was there was support there to support that regardless, money for finance to support that regardless of what that was, to let them achieve a positive destination and to support them along their journey. We don't do that. We're trying to... It's this one-size-fits-all again. You know, we, We're trying to fit them into to a rigid programme that doesn't always work. So if it was to follow the person, that might be more flexible uh, and have better results. There are some organisations where that is what they do. They do lots of different things within them. Their outcomes aren't any better than others, so it, that doesn't necessarily work either. It's just got to look at what, what are the real strengths. And, I, I, and one of the things I'm aware of, we, we've, not, we've only been doing the employability in the past couple of years, so we don't really have a real evaluation of it. We have the, the recent modern apprenticeship evaluation, which was really helpful um, in terms of what the strengths are, but we don't have that yet for employability. And of course, that's in terms of the ones even further removed. That's the, that's the kind of programme that really will try to get them into even more positive destinations. So I'm not entirely sure if putting resources into a this is a service that will do all of these things, will actually do it. Um, because that might be located someplace where, it's, let's just say it's in Glasgow, for example, and it's located in one part of Glasgow. People all over Glasgow will need those services, those little bits, so you wouldn't necessarily want it to have one particular place. And, what I'm, and we are aware of that within STF and STAG is that there are some wonderful small organisations out there doing some fantastic work just because that's what they do. So you wouldn't want to take away from that. And Scotland's lovely for that. There's some amazing stuff. Your organisation probably started from very little. Same with yours. Um, so I wouldn't want to lose that in terms of pushing funding into a, a, a one-stop shop type of thing. Because I'm not entirely convinced that would work. Okay. Yeah. Brian. Uh, you create a brand as well. Yeah, so Shmu is a brand. We are a project that young people come to, they know that they're going to get support. If that's watered down into a multi-agency, new name, new game, that, that goes that year's worth of history, that belief that young people, when they come along to Shmu, they know exactly what service they're going to get, gets lost. I'm not saying that we should get all of them. I like your idea about money following a young person. But I also like, I like group work. I think it works. I think young people need to learn how to work in groups. It's not all about one-to-one -one work. Yeah, uh, I know it's not, but it's, uh, I think they're taking that... I quite like actually the SDS system about having outcomes and about having being accountable. I think it's okay to be accountable, but it's about how they how they how they how they actually address it within the, the organisations. I think it's coming through quite clearly that what we really should be looking at should be the individual, and when they come from school and transition into either college or further education or training, that that action plan should actually go with them. Now, if that was actually to happen, then training providers like yourself would be able to then look at that person and make maybe a judgment of that person may need 26 weeks help and support, or that person may need four weeks help and support. Would, would that actually work, do you think, Fraser? Who else would we need to get involved? Yeah. Fraser Apologies. and then Lorna. Well, if you had that information, you would see what support was already there, so you had the contact is already made, it would make it much easier for us to, yeah. to follow up. 
Um, so yes, I, th I think so. And, and each of the statutory agencies has information on individuals, but they don't even share the information. So that's frustrating as well. Sorry, it was really just that, that exact point. Then you can start looking at what else do we need to, to put in place, including all the other organisations, to support that person to reach that destination. Yes, absolutely. Brian. Yeah, there has to be some... It's like you do an eight-week programme, we do a 12-week... So if you can find a young person who needs 26 weeks, there needs to be flexibility within absolutely. the employability yeah, fund absolutely. that they can say, actually, you can move those goalposts to 26 weeks, but they're quite rigid. That's a justification. Yeah, but you... So it's, it's OK saying you get six people who need 26 weeks, but if you've got a 12-week programme and you're funded for 12 weeks, how do you fund the, that extra work that needs to be done? So there needs to be work done on how that actually funding works. Really look at changing the model of the funding package then. I mean, this is just hypothetical. To say, say to a training provider, OK, we'll give you, say, 3,000 training weeks, right? And within that, you could then self-manage that for each individual person that came along to the programme. Fraser? Previously had that in place, where uh, we would decide at the start how long that person's uh, period of training would be, and we'd go back and agree that with uh, the career service, and that would go into their their training plan. And it could vary from 12 to it was up to a maximum of 22 weeks at that point. It was reducing down, but at least we had the flexibility. But the way it works now, I mean, we run a 12 week program, and beyond that, it's it's not viable to continue. Can I ask how how um good the flow is from you say is it career service that refer young people to you on the employability programme um, do, do you get people coming through, is there people sitting waiting in the background waiting for career service to actually refer people to you or is there a constant flow of people coming through that can actually access the programme, Brian? We, have to chase. we know the young people are there the stats are there to say the young people are there but Every time, every 12 weeks, we feel that we're, we're physically having to chase uh, SDS to give us the names of these young people so we can get them in to get a taster, rather than there just being that flow of young people getting sent out to these projects. I don't know how it is in other years, but we physically have to chase SDS to get the names. Why is that? It's something we're, we've been working on for the last couple of years. It seems to be every time we do a course, we're, we're up to it the last minute, a day or two before a course starts, still phoning advisors going... Can we get that person's details? Have you got that young person? And even as part of the employability fund, we thought that would disappear, but it hasn't. It's became a, a it's been, it became an uphill battle for us. Organisations, Lorna. No, we don't. We have the opposite problem where we don't have enough places, but we have for the to meet the demand. Um, and part of the problem around that, is, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because it leads into the local economic partnerships that aren't consistent throughout Scotland and are not always working. In Glasgow, we have not had any meetings with the local economic partnerships who make those decisions. So in the meantime, we have waiting lists of youngsters who want to join the programme but who can't because I don't have any more places. And I don't know when the next when the group will meet and make that kind of decision. So it's not consistent throughout Scotland. So the, the local economic partnership in Glasgow, they haven't met at all, did no. you say? Not at they all. Have so they have not, not with training providers. They, we, we, there was an expectation that they would meet once a month, for example, mm -hmm. with training providers to look at that, to look at demand and where it's being met, but that has not happened. The economic partnership do meet, but not including us. So clear. what do the local economic partnership actually do? Can you explain that? Well, and what their role is to link into yourselves? Yeah, I, as far as I'm aware, their job is to look at the um, employment needs of the particular area, Glasgow, for example, and match the employability fund programme to the employment needs. So they may say, well, we will need hospitality jobs, care jobs, um, construction jobs. So we will issue X number of employability places for these areas. And we anticipate that there will be a demand of such and such. But you need to review that on a regular basis in terms of, because it does change, as you know, it changes all the time. And that's where I think it's falling down in terms of um, our services, because we, we know from career guidance that there is a demand for youngsters who want the programmes and want them in specific areas, but we're kind of getting stuck at that point where the economic partnership's not quite keeping up to date with what the demand or the changes actually are. So that, that's my understanding of the, the, the partnership. Is that yours? Fraser? Yes, I mean, we, we, we're in a couple of areas. In, in uh, the Argyll and Butte area, they, they do meet physically um, it's DWP, uh, the Career Service and Schools Development Scotland. And again, just as, as Lorna has described, they, they look at the, 
the number of starts used and available and, and, and reissue or, or uh, to, to to meet the, the kind of local need. Um, but sensibly at the start, we we bust our contract very early on, and we were needing a decision because we had young people waiting to come on, uh, had no starts in the, in, in the contract, and they had a telephone meeting because of somebody in Inverness and somebody in Argyll, somebody in Verclyde came together. So there's been some flexibility there, which is was very encouraging. Um, but we, we don't, in terms of, of intake from, from the career service, we run a rolling programme because we, we're not running with groups, we're running with individuals, so whenever a young person is ready to engage. But quite often we will identify the young person, although present themselves to us because of our track record and working with friends, family, you know, siblings, etc. And then, but what we always do is is refer them back to the career service to be part of of the, of the system because that's that's important as well. Okay, thank you. Um, can I ask as well what part of the funding for yourselves, for your organisations, is most pro problematic or needs enhanced? Who wants to say, Brian, I'll pick on you first, Fair then is. I'll come um, to Fraser and Lorna. <laughs> <laughs> Truthfully, we need money for it all, but if we're needing to enhance anything, it's about uh, engaging, I think, engaging these young people who, who aren't part of the system yet, who aren't part of SDS, who aren't part of the school, who have maybe dropped out of school, who are a name only on a, on a book, but actually haven't engaged in any projects. And for me, certainly for us at SMU, we would like to tackle these unknowns. You were asking earlier about how we get back to the, the number to zero. We get the number to zero by targeting the ones that no one wants to target, the ones that are out there in the communities that we know they're there, we know their addresses, we know their houses, we know where they are, but there isn't any funding to actually achieve them because uh, it's, it's long-term work, it's not short-term work. It could take a year, it could take two years to even engage with these young people. But if you want to get a number down to zero, you need to go back to where these young people are and physically target them. And that, you need that long-term work. Not the, we get funded for Category 2 work, so that's that Stage 2. We get money for Stage 3 work. There isn't any money for that Stage 1 work because no one wants to touch it. That's where you transfer your number to zero by targeting where the, these unknown young people are. Mm -hmm. They're in everybody's stats, everybody's reports. There's always 90%, 80%, 70% unknowns, 20% unknown, they're the ones we need to target for it to work. Fraser? Yeah, just as previously stated, you know, in, in terms of, of the, the, the available funding, you're limited to what you can do, particularly from the rural aspect, is, is taking the service out to these areas. Um, there, is, there is travel budgets there for young people to go to work placement. But if there was something to compensate providers to take a service into these more rural areas, uh, in, in the past we, we've we've run, run programmes on, on Isla and, and Aran and these places where they've perhaps found a, a small core of young people and they've gone and they've funded us to go and do that. That's no longer available, for the, but, but there are young people there. So I think it's looking at, again, as I said earlier, if there was a package that, that attracted, or, or the young person attracted, and you could pull that all together, you, you could do an awful lot more for them. Um, and there's less flexibility now within the programmes. Uh, as we say, we, between, we, we do stages two, three and four of the employability fund, and uh, stage stage two with, within the different age categories as well, where perhaps if you bust one, one part of it, but you have a demand, you can't transfer across within your own contract. Everything has to go back centrally now back into a pot if it's unused and, and I, f I fear that areas like ours will, will possibly miss out because there'll be pressure for more places for some of the big providers in the, in the central belt. Lorna, thank you. Everybody should get an equal opportunity to do what they want so I'd, I'd, I'd like discrim discriminating areas because every uh, young student or young person is all they're all built off in uh, scales and stuff. They, 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 they want. To, they, we want to show off our skills, what we've got, what we can take to them. But, but, but they're not getting the opportunity because there's not that money in place to take to take them on, and it's it's really disappointing. And then, and then it get it gets taken away, and they just get you know they get um. They get uh, for, forgotten about, and I, and I and I don't think that should happen to a young person, because if every young person's got their own set of skills, they they, they know how to use their own skills in, in their own way. If 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 they go into an employer and stuff, and an employer asks them to do something, and it, it's it, it's okay for the young person to turn around and say to the employer, "Look, I can't do it that way." But what about if I adapt it to, to my needs? 
and it's a, it's about it's about the employers um working together and adapting it for for a young person. I, I know I know everything comes down to money, but if a young person's e eager enough, wanting to show off their skills to an employer, wh why not let them? Why it's, not let them? Yeah, it's exactly. a shame. It is, it definitely is a shame, Sandy, and well said for the voice of everybody else in the background. It's not getting that opportunity that you've actually managed to make for yourself as well. Lorna? In, in terms of funding, I think we have to understand what the needs are first in relation to equalities. Only this year, SDS are, are beginning to collect data on equalities and needs of, of the youngsters. It, it does seem a shame in terms of the equalities impact assessment. This is the first year we're starting to collect that data. It's interesting. But one of my concerns, I have a background in further education um, in four colleges, and I'm aware that they have sums and additional sums for those with additional learning needs. In all of the NTP programmes, there is no additional funds or recognition of any additional funds for, for people with additional needs. So there's a disparity, if you like, within the service and the delivery of it. So in colleges, you're allowed it, and in higher education, you're allowed it, but you're not within national training programmes, which we all agree are as important as the formal uh, further education and higher education. So that's one of the issues and concerns I have. It's not recognised. I think that would help. It's not the only answer, but it certainly would help and would be a little bit of parity, if you like. Um, but we certainly do need to understand what the needs are. So the collection of data is a first step. Why for a young person as well? If a, if a young person wants to move on to further education, why 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 does it have to come why does it have to come down to money and things like that? If that young person's got skills that that, that they've learnt and um the you know they've volunteered for a, for an organisation and they know they know they don't have the skills to offer yet, but the the knowers maybe a course out there um that they they can offer that skills and, and then give them the course that they want and th things like that. Um, or like like myself, um, I asked to go on the childcare course at college, and I I I was turned down because I need, needed a scribe at college. That that was the reason why I didn't didn't get to go on the childcare course, and that's why I had to, you know, go to VSA and say, look, I want. I want to work here, and they and VSA knew I wanted to work with them, um, but they, they 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 couldn't take me on because I didn't have the 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 qualification on under my belt. But I thought by by going to um Aberdeen College at the time, I thought you, you know that that barrier would have been lifted, and for for myself to go on the child career course, but I was actually uh, told no because. I need I needed a describe and there wasn't you know that money in place. But if there's a young person wants to do something, why not let them? Thank you very much for that, Sandy. Based on what you've actually said, we might look into that and do some more further investigation into it. Unfortunately, it's been a real interesting um, meeting. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I apologise, John. I apologise. Or have you run out of time? No, on you go very quickly. I apologise. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, I mean, just a couple of things then. A, volunteering was mentioned earlier on. A, do we get to the situation sometimes where volunteering becomes exploitation, really, by an employer? We certainly monitor that. We, the, there's been a, some, uh, a couple of employers that we have withdrawn from because that's what we felt they were doing, that they were taking advantage of the young person. But by and large, um, we found that employers don't, and they, they use that positively as a potential employee. If they have jobs, some of them recognise they don't have jobs, but they recognise what they are giving to the young person in terms of experience, a reference, and um, employability skills. But yes, we are very much aware of that, and that that's not what it's about. Uh, okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. We, we, we guard against that very carefully. There are organisations out there that are good for giving young people some positive work experience, um, but there are no jobs at the end of it, so we may use it for that to kind of get them into a routine before putting them out with an employer where there is the potential for a, for a job. Yeah. OK. Um, and I mean, the other area, I'm, I'm also on the Finance Committee, and clearly this is part of the budget process, and the reality is, you know, we're not going to get more money. It's, it's a question of moving money around. And so I'm just wondering about the emphasis of the way the money is being spent. I mean, is there too much going on mainstream 
services and not enough being targeted at people with additional young people with additional needs? Definitely, I think so. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, learning dif difficulties like get pushed aside, but we're both we're all human beings. We should in in this day and age we should all be working together. We, sh we shouldn't be discriminated because we we've got a disability or anything. We should all be working together. We should all, you know, have the the right e equal opportunity for um somebody that has additional support needs or doesn't have anything at all. But because at the at the at the end of the day, we, we we've all got skills and we've, and we've all got something that that we can offer to to an employer. Although, I mean, we do have limited funds, so, you know, there's always going to be more needs, aren't there, than we can actually meet. Yeah, but but we shouldn't be pu we shouldn't be pushed aside, though, and for, for, forgotten about, about. So I I just feel, you know, are so are so many barriers p p put in front of us. Um, in fact, there shouldn't be any barriers at all because we're all human beings. At the end of the day, we shouldn't manage to walk into an employer and say, "Look, this is what I've got to offer, and this is the skills that I've got. Is there an equal opportunity for me um, to 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 come and work here? It should it shouldn't all come, you know, that down to money and thing, things like that. If if somebody want if somebody wants to work, get get give them give them the opportunity to work." I just, I just, I, you, you know, it, it, it is upset, it, it is upsetting for a, 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 a young person if they, yeah, if, they, if they're turned down and said, you, you can't come and work for, for, for us because, because that young person hasn't, um, you know, managed to show off their skills to, to that employer, because. There is ways of employers now of uh, adapting the job to your needs. Thanks. I mean, my final point then would be also on the financial side. I mean, there's a big push at the moment for preventative spending and especially for early year spending that we should spend more money on three and four year olds and less money on teenagers, 20s, pensioners, all that kind of thing. But I mean, that would mean disinvesting from your services to help to put more into younger kids. How would you react to that? I think a lot of the organisations who are involved could have a lot to offer, even to the younger people. We don't get the opportunity to, to engage with the schools because we're not part of the education system. But I think we have the skills and experience to benefit them. Okay. I mean, you're hoping that um, the preventative work you do uh, longer term saves money. Uh, and I absolutely agree with early intervention. I still do think that um, the services we do, because we're not there yet, so you have to watch who you take it from in order to give to, um, and that's a that's a difficult one. That's your uncomfortable decisions to make. Um, <laughs> I recognise that. So, but I, I do agree with early intervention. Um, I'm not entirely sure how you balance that budget there, but I wouldn't take away from here because we're just beginning to um, move forward within the new employability. And I, I, I am very much a supporter of the national training pro uh, programmes and the new employability fund. So I can see a shift in progress. I certainly wouldn't want that to be uh, taken away. But difficult balancing decisions. Thank you. Thanks very much. That actually concludes today's meeting. Thank you very much for coming along. And our next meeting will take place on Thursday, the 13th of November. Thank you very much. <laughs>